from the top rope, and the Great American Bash, I bid you all good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you may be in this great land of ours or around the world. Welcome to the $55 million studio on the Pro Wrestle Machine. Whether you're a longtime fan reliving these monumental events or a newcomer eager to understand wrestling's rich history, you're in the right place. This episode is packed with insights, opinions, and a few surprises along the way. Let's get into this issue. Through the use of the Pro Wrestle Machine, June 28, 1999 Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Reaction to WWF Contracted Sable appearing on WCW TV. More on Heart WWF Lawsuit, more. Dave Meltzer. Wrestling Observer Newsletter. After a week, it is even less clear what WCW hoped to accomplish when putting Rena Merrow on Nitro on June 14th. While it was the talk of wrestling for the week, that didn't amount to a thing in the ratings. The ensuing Thunder show dropped even lower than the ratings marks of recent weeks, and it opened WCW up to potential legal action, which seemed stupid to strengthen the WWF's antitrust case against them at this stage of the game which is all her appearance really did. WCW's explanation that she came to the event and bought a ticket is ridiculous given the nature of the business, and one that nobody with half a brain will accept. The fact she was sitting in the front row with security guards around her and showed up well into the show makes that story even more outlandish. Marrow's even sillier explanation in a USA Today story on June 21st was that I wanted to see if the same level of obscenity was taking place. It was not. Although all WCW personnel were told not to mention Rena Marrow by any name, including her given name, there was something up on the WCW website with digital image photos from the show of her at ringside at the show with a series of captions, one of which referred to the name Sable. WCW immediately took the photos from the website the next day, but they remained on the directory. Titan Sports attorney Jerry McDevitt on June 16th talked with WCW lawyers and threatened to file a federal lawsuit immediately. WCW on June 18th responded by sending Titan a letter saying that Mrs. Merrow is not under contract to WCW, that no contract negotiations with her are going on, and that she wouldn't be appearing on WCW television anymore until either her contract expires, August 2001, or she gets her contract release from Titan Sports. She did not appear on Nitro on June 21st, nor were there even veiled references made by the announcers to her appearance in the first place. McDevitt said he was investigating rumors as to whether or not Mrs. Merrow was paid for her appearance on the show and didn't get answers from WCW attorneys to that question. While it would have been perfectly legal for Mrs. Merrow to watch a WCW wrestling show from the stands, appearing on television in the position that she did constituted a grave violation of her contract according to McDevitt, who vowed that there is no way she is ever going to get the rights to the name Sable nor is there any court precedent even if she were to win the lawsuit, of companies losing their intellectual property, the name and parts of the gimmick Titan created, to a competitor even if a performer leaves the company. The WWF has suspended Marrow from using the name Sable, which is a hot issue due to the Playboy issue set for an August release having her as a cover and centerfold model with a magazine wanting to publicize it as Sable. However, NBC Television on June 21st advertising her appearance on June 24th's Jay Leno show still billed her as World Wrestling Federation star Sable. She can sue us till the cows come home and she's not going to get it. The name Sable, McDevitt said. She can make all the allegations she wants and it won't get her anywhere. The $140 million lawsuit, incorrectly reported in most media sources as $110 million, is one of three highly publicized suits filed against Titan Sports in recent weeks. The most publicized is the wrongful death suit filed by Martha Hart on behalf of her children and Owen Hart's parents. There are no major revelations in the 118-page Hart family lawsuit against the WWF, Vince and Linda McMahon, the riggers and the companies that manufactured the equipment used in the stunt that killed Hart. One of Hart's attorneys, Gary C. Robb of Kansas City, is considered one of the top trial lawyers in the country and one of only a handful of lawyers who have litigated four jury verdicts in excess of $20 million in single injury or death cases. His $350 million jury verdict in a 1995 helicopter crash is the highest product liability jury verdict in U.S. legal history. He also litigated a $70 million verdict on behalf of a 20-year-old woman killed in an air crash and a $25 million verdict in a 1998 case on behalf of a local trial judge killed in a fall. Anita Port Robb, another of the lawyers in the case, litigated her own $20 million verdict on behalf of a brain-damaged child and a $14 million verdict for a child killed while being dragged by a school bus, which is the largest cash recovery for a wrongful death of a child in U.S. legal history. Missouri law which prohibits asking for specific damages in cases such as this and instead instructs the jury to decide, 
has led to some of the largest verdicts in the country in wrongful death or serious injury cases. Also named in the suit besides the McMahons and Titan Sports are Amspec Incorporated of Van Nuys, California, Lumar Limited of Havant, Hampshire, England, Lumar Marine Incorporated of Guilford, Connecticut, the Liftall Company of Mannheim, Pennsylvania and Riggers James Williams of Kansas City, Bobby Talbert of Orlando, Florida, who is the rigger who had worked on drops from the ceiling for WCW for Sting, Kevin Nash and Eric Bischoff, Matt Allman of Orlando, Florida and Jim Vinson of Shawnee, Kansas along with the city of Kansas City as the owners and operators of Kemper Arena. The lawsuit alleges negligence by the various defendants to provide proper equipment, setup, training in personnel and failure to take special precautions when conducting an inherently dangerous activity. The suit tries to tie Vince McMahon and Titan Sports into the liability for potential negligence of the riggers and for failure to properly train Hart for the stunt and supplying him with unsafe equipment along with not having proper precautions and backup set up in the event something malfunctioned, in particular failing to provide lifelines and lanyards that would limit free fall distance and the company failed to provide a safety net, a safety harness, backup cables, and a safety lock on the release mechanism among other things. Bassam Al Offman, the host of Good Morning Kuwait filed a $1.5 million lawsuit against Titan Sports in the United States claiming that by airing footage for promotional purposes on its television show of Vader roughing him up in an incident on the show, in 1997 that it defamed his character. Vader and Titan had claimed at the time that before the show Leon White, playing a bully heel character, was told by producers to be in character on the show. He grabbed Al Othman by the shirt and shook him. Al Othman, who was apparently not aware of this, walked off the set and filed charges and White was under house arrest in Kuwait in a story that garnered a lot of mainstream publicity in the U.S. It's a silly lawsuit, said McDevitt, who accused Al Othman and Rena Mero of piling on after the heart incident. Although it's pretty clear the titan slash Mero situation was disintegrating long before the death of Hart. Rena Mero has garnered a lot of publicity, including last week's TV Guide cover and a follow-up interview later in the week USA Today on June 21 and was scheduled to appear on Leno three nights later. Vin McMahon is scheduled to appear on Conan O'Brien later that evening although McMahon's appearance was scheduled before Mero's and due to the taping schedule of the two shows, McMahon may not be able to use O'Brien to even respond to anything Sable would say on the show airing just prior. McMahon has yet to appear on any major television show to discuss any of the lawsuits and personally not commented anywhere about specifics and allegations in any of the suits, having had his appearance on Larry King cancelled, having turned down requests from other shows, and refusing to comment on the specifics of the cases in print. Merrill was quoted in USA Today saying I think people do not realize that wrestling has no regulations. No state control. No federal control. No union. When I first signed three years ago, it was fun. But wrestling has changed tremendously over the years. It's become so obscene and violent. What hurts Marrow's credibility in this case, aside from the fact she participated in this change of the industry for two years and benefited greatly from it, is that at the same time she defended the company against criticism from the changes in published articles, from the outside it would appear she's only suing after contractual and creative differences spelled the end of the relationship. McMahon used Marrow as Sable to counter critics of the WWF just a few months ago that charged its programming was sleazy based on the audience it was drawing from. Unlike Owen Hart, who did come out publicly against the changes in the product, Sable was defensive of the new direction WWF product in many interviews while she was working in the company, saying it was aimed at adults and was no worse than anything else on primetime television, and said parents need to be parents and that as a parent she wouldn't allow her own daughter to watch Raw. McDevitt along with other WWF sources indicate that there is no merit to Marrow's claim that she signed her contract at the Nassau Coliseum under duress nor was threatened with termination by Jim Ross if she didn't sign at the time. McDevitt said there was correspondence between Marrow's agent and the WWF during the entire time period which would indicate clauses being negotiated and that she would have been aware of any contract changes. However, nobody to this point has even attempted to deny that the WWF scriptwriters had wanted her to lose her top by accident on Raw which she apparently wasn't willing to do since she never did so, which no matter how hypocritical Mero comes off to some if not most, still makes it hard to consider the WWF as completely innocent victims in this case. The allegation going so public also would appear to eliminate the accidental breast shot from the raw playbook, because WWF and USA Network wouldn't be able to defend it with the claim it was accidental as both the network and McMahon claimed when Jacqueline fell out of her top last year. McMahon was nearly as silly in the article, still attempting to blame Ted Turner for his and his company's current problems instead of addressing the company's own behavior in the aftermath of the heart tragedy? I think that opportunists such as our competitor are really behind a lot of all of this negativity. They don't know how to compete with us, and in essence what they're trying to do is beat the drums of negativity hoping that, in some way, 
that is going to hurt the organization or hurt our fans. The same story had a quote from Conan that is sure to cause hot water within WCW even though it does have to do with current storylines that company is doing to an extent, saying that the company is getting stale and fresh faces are being held back, not to mention it was the most truthful quote in the story. You have a lot of wrestlers that wield a lot of power. If you don't conform or be part of their clique, if you're not drinking or training with them, you get cut out. That's just bad business. He also said that at one point Bischoff was intolerable and that his condescending approach wasn't getting results but that Bischoff is trying to rectify it. Bischoff was furious at the quotes, feeling that it may be the first time Time Warner management realizes the situation within the wrestling company and there was said to have been a shouting match between Bischoff and Conan before Nitro later that day. Bischoff also noted that WCW and he have never said they were never going to do another ceiling drop stunt. He said Sting will do it again, but it's been put off out of respect. The response to the situation made him sound totally insensitive, and will only make WCW look bad if Sting comes down from the ceiling any time in at least the next several months, even though what Sting did was not the same as what Hart was supposed to do and was significantly safer since there were backups involved. The NBA, which isn't even associated with a Hart incident, banned coming from the ceiling at any of their games the day after Hart's death even though it is doubtful an NBA team had never had someone repel from the ceiling without backups in place either. Talbert, one of the defendants in the Hart lawsuit, was at the May 24th Nitro in Greenville, South Carolina to work as part of the crew for a proposed ceiling drop by staying at that show which was cancelled, although tapes of him coming from the ceiling did air during a commercial on that show which wasn't edited due to the incident from the previous night since the package had already been put together, an admittedly weak reason. McDevitt called the situation with Hart unfortunate, and wished both sides could have sat down on the issue and resolved things, trying to blame Bret Hart for spearheading things. It was just a ring entrance that everyone thought was safe and something terrible happened, he said, adding that a company that is negligent wouldn't hire people who they think are experts to coordinate such a stunt. McDevitt was critical of Johnny Cochran on his television show where Cochran came out strongly in favor of the Hart family in the lawsuit and talked about possible criminal prosecution along with pointing the finger of negligence at the World Wrestling Federation for failing to make safety a strong enough concern when asking men not trained at stunt work to do such a stunt. Cochran said that even if the riggers were at fault for not properly setting it up, since they were hired by the WWF, Cochran said that still points the finger of blame at the company. Cochran also suggested that it was likely the jury would send a strong message in the form of punitive damages at Titan Sports for creating an environment where ratings and profit come before safety of the employees. The criminal case is still open according to the Kansas City Police. McDevitt was asked to appear on the show and declined, and defended the WWF safety record saying that Hart was the only wrestler in the history of the company since it was owned by Vince McMahon Jr. to have ever died in the ring, in 1959 and 1961 respectively. In the pre-World Wrestling Federation days of Vince McMahon SR's company there were deaths in the ring of Ace Gordon and Chick Garibaldi. He was also critical of naming Linda McMahon, who wasn't even at the event, in the lawsuit. Cochran's primetime television show on Court TV on June 15 devoted a segment to the Hart case which included Richard Wilkes, the attorney who won a $26.7 million judgment against Titan Sports, later settled before an appeal for $10 million, for Chuck Austin a wrestler in his third pro match who was paralyzed as a result of taking a rocker dropper move wrong from Marty Jannetty in a squash match, landing head first instead of pancaking, at a Tampa television taping myself and Burt Sugar, a noted boxing author who has done some writing on pro wrestling as well. There was little in the way of anything newsworthy when it came to the ratings for June 21st other than it was the lowest combined audience to watch wrestling in a long time. Raw continued its domination with a 5.99 rating, 5.87 first hour, 6.09 seconds hour, and a 9.5 share. Nitro did a 3.09 rating, 3.56 first hour, 2.55 seconds hour, 3.14 third hour, and a 5.1 share. Over the head-to-head -head two hours, with Nitro going off at the hour and not including Raw's five unopposed extra minutes, it was Raw at 5.93 to Nitro's 2.85. Going back to the May 17th week, or one week before the Owen Hart death which led to an unusually high level of viewers on May 24th, 10.7 composite rating and more than 12 million viewers, and some residual on May 31st as well, the two companies combined for a 9.41 rating head-to-head. 10.7 million viewers, well down from the peak where it approached 12 million viewers in good weeks and was generally topping the 11 million mark before WCW began its freefall a few months back. The audience fell to an 8.78 composite and fell below 10 million total viewers for the first time in probably more than one year. 
Raw peaked with the Austin vs. Bossman match doing a 6.21 rating and the Shamrock Test Jarrett three-way doing a 6.10 rating. Its low mark was the first quarter with the Triple H Taker confrontation leading to the entire CM, the McMahons Austin and Shawn Michaels appearing which did a 5.56. The weakness of that first quarter of Raw is highly unusual since WCW's first opposed quarter featuring the end of the Master P birthday angle and the return of Eddie Guerrero against Juventud Guerrero drew a miserable 2.43 rating, which wasn't even the show's low point as the beginning of Booker T vs. Chris Canyon did a 2.39. Nitro's head-to-head -head peak was the Sting vs. Sid Vicious match which did a 3.59 rating but that still got beaten handily by Vince and Shane vs. Patterson and Briscoe, and the beginning of Undertaker vs. Triple H which did a 5.66. The five-minute finish of Undertaker vs. Triple H, which went unopposed with Nitro going off the air on the hour, did a 7.37 rating. The Conan and Mysterio Jr. vs. Page and Canyon and Bigelow match with the Master P and No Limit Soldiers overtones and visual run-ins did a 3.09 quarter, losing to a 6.06 for Big Show vs. Holly. Overall, Raw doubled Nitro's audience in 4 out of 8 head-to-head -head quarters. Other numbers for this past week saw Livewire on June 19th do a 1.8 rating, Superstars on June 20th did a 2.0 and Sunday Night Heat on June 20th did a 4.22 rating. For WCW, June 19th WCW Saturday Night did a 1.9 rating and Thunder on June 17th did a 2.93 rating. Japanese Television Rundown May Toriyuman This aired matches from the April 22nd Karakuen Hall and April 25th Kawasaki Club Chita Shows 1. Yoshiyuki Saito beat Genki Horiguchi in 10.33 with the old Tim Woods cradle while standing on his head. This was a fast-paced real good lucha-style match. Horiguchi did a move that could be best described as a backwards pile driver, similar to the Tommy Rogers Tomakase finisher but more as a pile driver, that looked sick. 3 in a quarter stars. 2. Shima Nobunaga and Sumo Fuji and Judo Suwa beat Magnum Tokyo and Dragon Kid and Kenichiro Arai in 33-17. This was an awesome main event very similar to their Karakuen Hall six-man main event from the first tour in February. This was a better match even though the other one had more hot spots, but it went too long for guys that don't know how to pace and do psychology. Tokyo gets a total superstar reaction for his ring entrance, he slipped on the ropes doing a high spot and hit an Aussie moonsault early. Dragon had his shoulder taped up, he had surgery a week later. Most of the match saw the heel team, Crazy Max, work on Arai and Dragon. Tokyo worked little. Arai did a comeback with a firebird splash and a reverse diving headbutt on Fuji. It was one near fall after another with hot moves, many of which was new inventions. Dragon is the smoothest worker flying wrestler I've ever seen. He doesn't do the real dangerous spots and dives that guys like Sasuke did but his Hurricane Ranas are so smooth and fast they put Mysterio Jr. to shame. His Dragon Rana which is a forward flip off the top, landing on the opponent's head and taking them over in the other direction like a Hurricane Rana may be the hottest move in wrestling today. Nobunaga did a twisting dive over the top. Tokyo did his Viagra driver which starts like a meltdown and ends like a Michinoku driver too followed by a shooting star press for a near fall. Suwa did a super bomb on Tokyo for a near fall. Finally Fuji pinned Tokyo after a lariat and the heels destroyed the faces ending with Suwa unmasking Dragon Kid to set up their NWA welterweight title match a few days later. Four and a quarter star. Three. The next three matches were from April 25th in Kawasaki. Arai upset Fuji in 1447 after a firebird splash and his reverse headbutt off the top. Fuji threw some awesome clotheslines. Big pop for the upset. Two and a half stars. 4. Subo Jinjin pin stalker Ichikawa in 905. Ichikawa came out wearing a dress, but he's got this contraption which looks like a huge erect you know what with a snake head on it coming from you nowhere. I have this feeling we'll be seeing this next on WWF television. Thankfully he took it off before the match started. It was all comedy and mainly real bad comedy. It was like watching a 60s midget match in 1999. The finish saw Ichikawa running the ropes forever and Jinjin just sitting there watching and laughing. Finally Ichikawa collapsed from exhaustion and was pinned. Negative one and a half stars. 5. Yoshikazu Taro and Fuji and Nobunaga beat Horiguchi and Saito and Susumu Mochizuki in 1636. Crazy Max basically destroyed the face team for most of the match, not even selling a lot of their stuff early. The faces finally made a comeback toward the end and it was a better than average match. Highlight was Saito getting an armbar off a choke slam spot. Fuji pinned Saito after a lariat. 
two and a half stars. 6. Suwa won the NWA welterweight title pinning Dragon in 1229. Dragon showed his inexperience in spots having to work along singles as opposed to just doing high spots in trios matches as most of his career has been. Still, after some rough early spots, it turned into a really hot match. Dragon did a flying hurricane rana off the top rope onto Suwa on the apron, then reversed it into a flip into the ring instead of both crashing on the floor. That timing had to be perfect or they'd both be hurt. Dragon used a double springboard into a split-legged moonsault. He used his Dragon Rana for a near fall. Finish was tremendous. Dragon went for a springboard Hurricane Rana but Suwa blocked it and appeared to be delivering a power bomb. but Dragon reversed it into the smoothest Hurricane Rana right before impact, and Suwa rolled with it into a cradle for the pin. Three and a half stars. May 23rd Pancrase. Unfortunately this show epitomizes the problems with Pancrase as a spectator sport in 1999. It's basically submission wrestling with some standing exchanges thrown in. However, the fighters are now good enough to avoid submissions that it becomes almost like a chess match that appeals only to the most hardcore fans. On this show, there were no matches that ended in submission, and only one point scored the entire show. So it was a series of 0-0 matches decided by judges after going the time limit between skilled competitors. 1. Manabu Yamada beat Leon Dake by a majority decision, a third judge voted for a draw, in 10 minutes. Dake is the superior striker but Yamada was always able to take him down. At one point Dake got an accidental finger in Yamada's eye going for an open hand shot. Yamada's eye wasn't even right when he asked to continue as he could barely open it and it was closing uncontrollably. He still went on and took Dake down and mainly controlled him on the ground. After the match Dake said that he has to learn to block shoots better. 2. Takafumi Ito won a unanimous decision over Daisuke Ishii after the 10 minutes time limit. Match seemed even. 3. Kosei Kubota won a unanimous decision over Daisuke Watanabe after 10 minutes. Kubota nearly got a choke midway through the match which was enough to get him the decision. 4. Asami Shibuya drew Ihuiza Minowa over 10 minutes regulation and 3 minutes overtime. After the end of regulation, all three judges ruled it a draw and they went into overtime. Neither gained any serious advantage in overtime either. These two were more aggressive than the wrestlers in the previous matches. 5. In a ranking match, Jason Delucia scored a majority decision, one judge ruling it a draw, over Ryushi Yanagisawa after 15 minutes. Delucia mounted Yanagisawa early and threw a few blows from the top and went for a forearm choke. Delucia controlled him grappling for the first 450. After Yanagisawa escaped, he took Delucia down and was in the guard. Delucia struck some from the bottom and Yanagisawa struck some from the top. Delucia reversed him, but Yanagisawa reversed him back and eventually got the mount but Delucia reversed him again. It was a pretty even match with Delucia having only a slight edge. 6. In a ranking match, Kiyuma Kunyoku scored the only point of the show beating Keiichiro Yamamiya after 15 minutes in a match if you took that point away, that Yamamiya probably would have won the upset decision in. This was by far the best match on the show. It had a lot of good stand-up exchanges which both took some hard slaps although Yamamiya seemed to get the better of most exchanges. Kunyoku got a bloody nose, Kunyoku got a takedown at 9.15 and realizing he was trailing, started pounding him from the top. Yamamiya escaped. The only point came at 11.15 on a rope break when Kunyoku got an ankle lock. Yamamiya then took him down and threw a lot of palms from the top. They traded mainly slaps with a few knees and kicks until the time limit expired. Yamamiya seemed to tire more than Kunyoku as the match progressed, but when the bell rang both guys immediately collapsed from exhaustion on the mat. Very good match but overall from a spectator standpoint it was a boring show. May 29th New Japan 1. Shinjiro Otani beat Masao Orihara in a Super Junior Tournament match in 937. Orihara did his Orihara moonsault off the middle ropes to the floor, before the bell even rang. Very Americanized psychology to this match. Orihara isn't very good but this was still an excellent match, probably because they didn't try and do a 15 minutes match and because Otani is that great. At one point Orihara was begging in the corner and the announcers were all talking about him doing a Ric Flair spot. The last several minutes were near falls back and forth with excellent heat. Orihara used a German superplex and a moonsault for a near fall. He went for a second moonsault but Atani got his knees up. Atani did a springboard dropkick, followed by a powerbomb and finishing up with a dragon suplex to get the pin. Orihara appeared to have suffered a broken nose during the match as it looked like it had exploded. 4 stars. 2. 
Gran Hamada pinned Jushin Liger in a Super Junior Tournament match in 10.08. It started with mat work that was solid. Hamada, who is now 48 is still probably the best worker for his age in the world although he's no longer one of the top juniors in the world as he was for almost his entire career. They picked it up with basic stuff that built well and the crowd was into it. Hamada kicked out of Liger Shota, palm blow, and running Liger bomb and followed with a swinging DDT and a super DDT and got the surprise pin. Three and a quarter stars. Three. Kensuke Sasaki and Shiro Koshinaka beat Masahiro Chono and NWO Sting in a non-title match at 7.49. Match had great heat due to Chono. Match had good heat. Finish saw Chono accidentally shoulder block NWO Sting off the top rope and Sasaki pinned NWO Sting after two lariats. New Japan is by far the best wrestling promotion, as opposed to a sometimes captivating soap opera with wrestlers as characters like WWF, and is the basic antithesis of WCW in that they get everything and everyone over, and most importantly, get their product over with credibility. It's really mind-blowing when you see NWO Sting, remember Jeff Farmer as Lightning and as Craig Pittman's soldier that he left in the jungle or something, and now he's a lot more over than Sting is in WCW. Two and three-quarter stars. Four. Tatsumi Fujinami and Genichiro Tenryu beat Keiji Muto and Hiroyoshi Tenzan in 14.01. The final 7.30 aired on television, and it was a hot match. Muto and Tenzan worked as a really smooth team, like the old mid-80s Midnight Express with the continuity. There were some notable messed up spots with Tenzan in against both the older guys. Tenzan used a forearm off the top and a headbutt off the top on Fujinami for near falls. Fujinami used a dragon sleeper but Muto saved and did a dragon screw on both opponents. Finish was excellent ending with Fujinami getting the figure 4 on Tenzan and Tenryu getting the war special, a double arm lock on Muto and Tenzan tapped out. 3 and a half stars. June 5th New Japan. 1. Tatsutoshi Goto and Mishiyoshi Ohara beat Shiro Koshinaka and Tadao Yasuda in 10.55. The last five minutes aired and it was a surprisingly good match with excellent heat and the surprise finish served a booking purpose. Goto and Ohara undid the turnbuckle padding and rammed Koshinaka into it. Yasuda did his hot tag spot with a sumo chops, double arm suplex, a drop kick and tiger driver. For whatever reason, Yasuda's comeback always gets over huge almost as this cult deal. Goto gave Yasuda a back suplex and a clothesline for near falls. Koshinaka tagged in with two hip attacks and a third off the ropes. He blocked Goto's back suplex and did a near fall on Ohara with a power bomb. Ohara delivered two low blows to Koshinaka and a choke slam for the surprise pin. This finish was to set up Goto and Ohara as tag title challengers on this tour for Koshinaka and Sasaki. Three and a quarter stars. Two. Sasaki and Brian Johnston beat Takashi Izuka and Yuji Nagata in 1430. The last five minutes aired on television and it was really good mainly due to Nagata and Izuka. Izuka may be the most underrated wrestler around and he's a really good worker with limited charisma who is lost in the shuffle here. Johnston was noticeably green but rarely in during the match. Sasaki isn't one of New Japan's better workers, but he can be carried. Sasaki ended up using a new leg submission on Nagata for the win. Three and a quarter stars. Three. Chono and NWO Sting and Don Fry beat Muto and Tenzan and Satoshi Kojima in 15-16. This match had super heat, particularly down the stretch with Muto's team carrying the action. Fry and Chono did some spots where they'd accidentally punch and kick the other. Chono and Kojima traded lariats and Yakuza kick spots no selling until Chono went down to a big pop. Muto in particular was great, but he's been doing his best wrestling in years of late. Finish saw Fry hit Kojima with a knockout punch and Chono made him submit to the STF. After the match, Chono asked for Atsushi Onita's music, Fry and NWO Sting acted at first like they didn't know what was happening. Onita came out to an incredible reaction, like Hogan in his prime but with a rock-like reaction to the words. The crowd did Onita's catch mannerisms with him but the frenzy when he came out totally blows rock out of the water and probably exceeds even Austin. Chono called Onita Mr. Pro Wrestling which got a lot of heat since that was the term reserved for respected wrestlers like Harley Race and Ric Flair in the early 80s. Onita was pelted with an amazing amount of garbage and they were encouraging it for the visuals, with Onita yelling about wanting Ricky Choshu and Muto. Three and three quarter stars. Four. Minoru Tanaka beat Atani in 1357 in the Super Junior Tournament. Good mat work early. Fans turned on Atani when he wouldn't break on the ropes to make Tanaka into the underdog babyface. Tanaka is a lot cooler to watch working the ground than Kendo Kashin. 
He's not great with his high spots but his quickness and transitions on the ground are as good as any anyone. Atani used a dragon suplex, a springboard drop kick to the back and a power bomb for near falls. Tanaka reversed a dragon suplex into a wakegatami, Fujiwara armbar and the crowd was going nuts leading to an awesome rope break spot. Tanaka then grabbed an ankle lock in the middle and Atani held out for a long time selling it great before tapping. The place literally exploded like the final seconds of an NCAA basketball championship game that was decided on a last second shot. Four and a quarter star. Five. Liger beat Koji Kanemoto in a tournament match in 2029. The final 10 minutes aired and again this was super like a typical major match between these two. Kanemoto mainly used ankle locks to wear Liger down. All the submissions had great heat because of how well they were sold. Liger came back with moves like a power bomb and a brain buster and a running Liger bomb. Kanemoto did some flashy kicks leading to a moonsault for a near fall and a standing hill hold for a rope break. The highlight was Liger, while standing on the top rope behind Kanemoto, doing a released German suplex. Luckily Kanemoto knows what he's doing and managed to flip all the way over because that is one scary dangerous move. After a palm blow Liger grabbed the ankle lock in the middle. Kanemoto struggled for the ropes for a long time before tapping. This was every bit as good a finish as the previous match and may have been the best one-hour wrestling television show of the year and best major card as well at least thus far this year. I'd say this was more of a must-see than even the Misawa Kobashi match, because that was a great wrestling match which every company from time to time has, but this was an example of a great wrestling promotion at a level that few companies ever reach. Anyone watching this show and paying attention will be able to see everything wrong with WCW clearly, and quite frankly how many things could be changed with the talent they already have to make it a hot promotion within six months or less. New Japan has proven how to get marginal talent to be taken as effective people on the show Goto, Ohara, Yasuda, and W. Osting, how to mix UFC fighters into pro wrestling with them maintaining their authenticity and not just being green pro wrestlers, Johnston, Fry, getting clean simple finishes, through education and selling, to be more exciting than run-ins and ref bumps that eventually become shortcuts for people with lazy ideas, and how to use smaller guys as main eventers as a special occasion, on this sold-out house show, the two main events were the junior matches even above Chono, who is New Japan's Austin, how to run tournaments and how to use wrestlers from other companies and how to create new stars and matchups, Tanaka is a battlers guy who they put over Atani, one of their best wrestlers and all it did was make Tanaka somebody without hurting Atani in the least. Four and a half stars. June 6th All Japan. 1. Kenakowashi and Toshiaki Kaoda beat Mitsuharu Misawa and Akira Tawe in 24-24. They aired the final 15 minutes of this dream tag match from the final AJ show in Sapporo. It was excellent, particularly Misawa's work. Misawa took a half-Nelson German suplex on his head on the floor from Kobashi and was destroyed for several minutes by both opponents. Tawe had tagged in, and was a little Tawe-ish on his comeback before hitting the Natawa on Kobashi for a near fall. He teased the Natawa off the apron, but Kobashi blocked it and Tawe countered with a DDT on the apron and hit another Natawa on Kobashi in the ring. Kawada and Tawe traded and Zoijiris before Misawa tagged in and used a Tiger Driver on Kawada for a near fall. Kobashi did his power bomb of Misawa onto the turnbuckles. Misawa came back with his elbow suicida on Kobashi, followed by a missile drop kick and a splash off the top rope. Tawe tagged in and hit the dynamic bomb on Kobashi but Kawada gave Tawe two Enzoijiris and Kobashi lariated him for the pin. Four and a half stars. Two. Takao Mori and Yoshihiro Takayama won the All Asian Tag Team titles from Jinsei Shinzaki and Hayabusa in 27 11. The final six minutes aired on television and it was shockingly fantastic with great heat, which I guess speaks volumes for Hayabusa and Shinzaki. Hayabusa did an amazing Firebird 450 splash on Takayama and a springboard knee drop for another near fall. The All Japan team did a double team powerbomb on Hayabusa while Takayama leg dropped Shinzaki. Amori used a Ray Stevens bombs away on Shinzaki for a near fall. Shinzaki hit his reverse drop kick. Amori did another bombs away on Shinzaki followed by a dragon suplex for a near fall. Finally Shinzaki missed his backward drop kick on Amori, who came off the ropes with the old Hogan axe bomber, a funky Davy Boy Smith style lariat, for the pin. Four and a quarter stars. June 13th All Japan. 1. Misawa pinned Kobashi to retain the Triple Crown in 43-40. For drama and building, this was by far the best match this year. It was slow-paced because they went long and isn't the type of match that would appeal to everyone. 
a lot of fans would recognize it as a good match but slower pace than their taste for about 33 minutes and many would be bored by he length and pacing, although after watching the entire match, the heat for the finish and drama was such that you couldn't deny it as at least a strong candidate for match of the year. I'd rate it slightly below their match that won match of the year last year, but this had more dangerous spots and they took more legit punishment, again probably too much for both of their own goods and I don't see any match so far this year that beats it. Before the match started, Misawa walked backstage like a man much older than his 37 years. It was very reminiscent of seeing Terry Funk 10 years ago in WCW when he had the bad knees and broken back and could barely walk, and then when the bell would ring, he'd go out there and do match of the years with Ric Flair. They aired about 32 minutes on television, starting at about the 12 minutes mark. Kobashi Power slammed Misawa on the floor, Kobashi worked the arm for several minutes doing the old pump handle move from the 70s including doing it over the buckles. This was almost like seeing 70s fashion being brought into the 90s and it being perceived as something new and seeing it get over. Kobashi got the armbar but Misawa made the ropes. He delivered a German suplex and a half-Nelson German suplex on Misawa's head to set up a kneeling armbar. In between the two suplexes Misawa got a flurry of elbows, one of which was too stiff to the nose and where Kobashi got the broken nose. Kobashi was bleeding pretty badly from the nose, but the blood dried fairly fast. Kobashi suplexed Misawa over the top to the floor, but Misawa landed on his feet on the floor and wound up back suplexing Kobashi off the apron onto the back of his head on the floor. Misawa followed with his elbow suicida, a missile drop kick and a high splash off the top for a near fall. He struggled and finally hit the tiger driver, but then Misawa started selling the bad right arm. Misawa went for a tiger driver off the apron but Kobashi blocked it and flipped Misawa off the apron and gave him a half Nelson German suplex on his head on the floor. People talk about stunts being dangerous and these guys have continued to do moves similar to this for years and they're still not only active but the best in the game, but how these men continue to do matches this brutal is beyond me. In the ring, Kobashi hit a German suplex and a high power bomb. Misawa blocked a pile driver, but Kobashi came back with his orange crush bomb for a near fall and a moonsault for a great near fall. This was the 33 minutes mark and the crowd was going nuts. Misawa ducked a lariat but Kobashi hit a rabbit lariat. The tease the torture rack dropped into the Death Valley driver but Misawa blocked that. Misawa was sitting on the turnbuckle and Kobashi leveled him with a clothesline taken right out of a famous Hanson vs. Kobashi match many years ago in the same building but Misawa draped his foot on the ropes to avoid the pin. Kobashi tried a power bomb on the floor but Misawa turned it into a hurricane rana, and in spinning through, Misawa hit his head on the floor. Misawa in the ring delivered a German suplex after ducking a lariat. Misawa blocked another lariat by putting both hands in the way. Misawa worked on the lariat arm and delivered a tiger suplex and a spinning elbow and a tiger driver 91, similar to Stevie Ray's slapjack, for near falls. Kobashi came back with a choke dropped backward into a German suplex on Misawa's head and a lariat for a big near fall. Misawa ducked a second lariat and hit three more elbows, another spinning elbow, a funky somersault sent in off the middle ropes, a half Nelson Tiger suplex for a near fall before getting the pin with the Emerald Erosion or Emerald Driver which is a side pile driver similar to the Dreamer Driver move that Tommy Dreamer picked up watching the tape of last year's Misawa vs. Jun Akiyama match where Misawa debuted it. The place came unglued for the finish and the emotional rush of fans hitting the ring and chanting for Misawa. They showed both guys being helped to the back glassy-eyed. Five stars. Mexico. At the Triple Mania 7 show on June 11, before a sellout 13,000 fans in Ciudad Madero, the main event was a Piraeus Increíbles match, incredible partners, with Tecnico's Pero Aguayo and Octagon teaming with Rudo Cobarde to beat Rudos El Texano and Sandre Chicana and Tecnico Pero Aguayo Jr. by the third fall. The regular heels and faces wound up teaming with each other until a man in black, spoofing EMLL which is doing its own mystery man in black gimmick, helped Aguayo win his final Triple Mania match. The man unmasked, revealing Jacques Mate. Heavy Metal and Felino representing their father Tropicasses, beat kickboxer and tie boxer, representing Tarantes in a hair versus hair match. In the final fall, when Metal was about to be pinned after Tarantes gave him a low blow, Tropicasas gave Kickboxer a low blow and in Metal scored the pin with La Magistral thus forcing Tarantes to get his head shaved for the first time. The Pentagon vs. Shirchitl Hamada Man vs. Woman match wound up being called an exhibition since wrestling is still regulated in Mexico and this sort of thing isn't allowed. Pentagon won via DQ when he pretended she had kicked him low. We don't have details on this at press time, but the CMLL organization has folded and it is now all under the EMLL banner. 
I always get confused because the EMLL TV show calls itself Consejo Mundial de Lucha Libre CMLL. All of the CMLL belts will remain under those names. In regard to the late Diablo Velasco, who passed away on June 13th, several other big names and even legends of Mexican wrestling that we didn't list last week that were in part trained by him included El Gladiador, Gori Guerrero, Tony Salazar, Enrique Vera, and El Solitario. He also trained Sangre India who is believed to be the only wrestler in history ever to have died from missing a tope at Arena Mexico back in 1979. They had already scheduled the 40th anniversary show at Arena Coliseo in Guadalajara for June 20th, which also honored Velasco and drew an estimated 7,000 fans. The main event on the show had Mil Mascaras and Gigante Silva beating Cien Caras and Dr. Wagner Jr. and Apollo Dantes when Silva put Wagner and Dantes together and splashed both of them off the middle ropes and Mascaras used his trademark flying body attack on Caras for the pin. After the match, Universo 2000 and Kurgan hit the ring and did a 5-on-2 attack. Earlier in the show, Caesar and Apollo Dantes attacked Pepe Agueo, with a chain to build to a hair versus hair match with Pepe versus Apollo on June 27. After doing the natural hints for week, they also did the first physical angle in Mexico City with Silva versus Kurgan, which they are hoping to turn into a major drawing angle since Silva speaks Spanish fluently and can be an Andre the Giant level babyface, and Kurgan can be the John Stud, Blackjack Mulligan, Ernie Ladd, Hulk Hogan Hill role, which is a natural draw especially in a culture where most of the people are so small? On June 18th at Arena Mexico, Silva and Atlantis and Mr. Niebla beat Villano Tercero and Mascara Ano 2000 and Universo 2000 in the main event. After the match, Kurgan, Cien Caras and Dantes hit the ring and they all attacked Silva and the other Technicos until the head hunters, Negro Casas, Rosso de Plata and Zorro made the save. Kurgan and Silva attempted a pull-apart brawl. This leads to June 25th in a three-on-four main event with Silva and Niebla and Brasso de Plata vs. Kurgan and Dantes, NC and Caras and Universo 2000 plus Casas, and Santo and Atlantis vs. Viano Tercero and Black Warrior and Pieroth Jr., making his return with Shocker back from Japan. They are continuing the angle leading to his heel turn. He's still on the face side but barely helps out. His not helping out led to Wagner Jr. and Fuerza Guerrera and Black Warrior beating Al Ijo del Santo and Casas and Shocker in two straight falls in the semifinal. Aspectro Jr. retained the Mexican national middleweight title beating Mascara Sagrada Jr. on June 17th in Toluca. Pirata Morgan kept the IWC heavyweight title beating Mascara Sagrada on June 16th in Celea. All Japan. Kenna Kobashi had surgery on June 16th to repair his shattered nose from the Misawa match five days earlier. The doctor told him to take at least one month off and not to train for a few weeks. Of course he was already back training by the weekend and has already confirmed he'll be back in the ring when the new tour starts on July 4th. Matches announced for the biggest shows of the next tour are, July 4th at Karaku and Hall has Mitsuharu Misawa and Masahiro Kakihara vs Toshiaki Kawada and Akira Tawe, Vader vs. Jinsei Shinzaki, Kobashi and Kentaro Shiga vs. Takawa Mori and Yoshihiro Takayama, Jun Akiyama and Yoshinobu Kanemaru vs. Yoshinari Ogawa and Masamichi Marufuji and Johnny Ace and Bart Gunn and Johnny Smith vs. Gary Albright and Manukiya Mossman and Pierre Ulit. Misawa has been criticized a lot of late, and with good reason in some cases, for his booking and certainly when it comes to booking of his first tournament in April he couldn't hold a candle to Baba and really whatever success All Japan is having on big shows has to do with Misawa the wrestler inside the ring and not Misawa the booker. But the one thing you can see by this lineup and other lineups on this tour is an attempt to use the established stars like himself, Vader, Kobashi, Akiyama, etc. to elevate people like Ogawa, Kakiara, Shiga, Takayama and Amori to get people ready to accept Kanemaru and Marufuji eventually high on the cards as well. July 11th in Osaka has Kawada and Tawe and Jun Izumaida vs. Ace and Gun and Smith, Akiyama vs. Shinzaki, Masao Inoue vs. Albright, Masawa and Ogawa and Marufuji vs. Kobashi and Akiyama and Kanemaru and Amori and Takayama vs. Vader and Ulit. July 16th in Matsudo will have three surprise singles matches with Misawa, Ogawa and Kakihara facing either Kobashi, Akiyama or Shiga in a best of three set of singles bouts. July 17th at Karakuen Hall has Kawada vs. Takayama, Misawa and Ogawa vs. Kobashi and Shinzaki, Albright and Amori vs. Vader and Mossman, Akiyama and Shiga vs. Ace and Gun, Tawe and Honda vs. Smith and Ulit. July 19th in Matsumoto has Tawe vs. Vader, Kawada vs. Shinzaki, Misawa and Ogawa and Kakihara vs. Kobashi and Akiyama and Shiga, Albright and Takayama and Amori vs. Ace and Gun and Smith. 
Final night of the tour is July 23rd at Budokan Hall with the already announced two title matches of Misawa vs. Kaoda and Ace and Gun vs. Amori and Takayama. Also it'll be Kobashi and Akiyama vs. Vader and Albright, Taue vs. Ulit and Ogawa and Kakihara vs. Smith and Shinzaki. Misawa had his 37th birthday party as a somewhat of a media event on June 18th at the All Japan office. It was traditional for the birthday of the company president, January 23rd, to be a big deal when Baba was president. New Japan The major push is the Keiji Muto vs. Atsushi Onita feud which will probably feature their first singles match outdoors at Tokyo Jingu Stadium on August 28th. Jingu Stadium is a few miles from the Tokyo Dome and holds about 46,000 fans and pro wrestling sold it out once in 1993 for the first Nobuiko Takata vs. Vader match. The idea is for it to be Great Muto vs. Great Nita. They are doing an angle where Onita wants a shot at Muto for the IWGP heavyweight title on July 21st in Sapporo, and New Japan has said no way because Muto already has a title defense the previous night against Satoshi Kojima. Onita in the angle is saying that if he doesn't get the title shot, that he won't appear for the Jingu Stadium show? The Jingu Stadium match will almost certainly be an explosive barbed wire match as the excuse for the match being at the stadium and not the dome is that Tokyo Dome officials hate fire being used as a prop in the building, that's a shoot as I was backstage in 1995 and they strongly threatened to cancel a show in front of 60,000 fans when an undercard match on a 13 promotion show with Cactus Jack, Terry Funk and the Headhunters featured an attempt at using fire, Supposedly Dome officials weren't happy with Onita's ring entrance where he smokes a cigarette copying Sandman. The reality is it would be no big deal for Onita to simply not smoke during one ring entrance if that would screw up a Dome deal. The reality of the story is that New Japan is planning another Tokyo Dome show in October, and preliminary talks have opened back up with UFO and the best drawing match possible out of that mix would be Shinya Hashimoto vs. Naoya Ogawa playing off their January deal. New Japan didn't want to run two shows in that building so close together. Although the idea behind that is sound, it makes little sense when attempting to run another stadium-caliber card not only in the same market but literally a few miles away. In addition, it rains often in Tokyo in August and this is not a domed stadium. There is some talk that this would be the show where Takata returns to pro wrestling since he's the wrestler this building is associated with to pro wrestling fans since all three prior shows in the building were with Takata as the star. December 5, 1993 beating Vader. August 17, 1996 beating Yoji Anjo in a show that bombed drawing only 5,000 and September 11, 1996 beating Genichiro Tenryu before about 35,000 fans. There's an unpaid debt so to speak from three years ago where Shinya Hashimoto still owes Takata a win for Takata dropping the IWGP strap to him at a Tokyo Dome show. The first night of the new tour is June 25th at Karakuen Hall with Hashimoto and Yuji Nagata vs. Muto and Kojima, Kendo Kashin vs. Tatsuhito Takaiwa, Manabu Nakanishi and Meng vs. Scott Norton and Hirayoshi Tenzan, and a non-title match with Kensuke Sasaki and Shiro Koshinaka vs. Tatsutoshi Goto and Mishiyoshi Ohara which I'd presume Goto and Ohara almost have to win since the title match is scheduled for June 27th in Shizuoka. New Japan also announced an IWGP Junior Tag title defense with Jushin Liger and Great Sasuke defending against Shinjiro Itani and Takaiwa on July 13 in I Wait. Although it is said that Masahiro Chono came to the United States this past week to meet with Eric Bischoff and Norton, in reality he came in for further medical treatment of his neck. Other Japan Notes The major indie angle of the week involves Koto Fuyuki who is doing the heel commissioner gimmick, saying that Hayabusa can't wear his mask on the next tour. They're building to a final match where Hayabusa wears the gimmick on August 25th in Sapporo Nakajima Sports Center which is FMW's last card in the building. The real story behind all this is that Eiji Izaki, who is now 30, has suffered so many injuries that he doesn't want to do the masked flyer gimmick and feels the only way to continue his career is to tone down and feels he's got to be taken seriously as a real wrestler, and the only way to do this is take the mask off. Big Japan is doing a main event gimmick trying to recreate the famous Funks vs. Avila the Butcher feud with a tag feud of Terry Boy, Men's Teo using his former ring name, and Dory Boy, Shinya Kojika, the company president who is actually about the same age as Dory Funk, against the original Abdullah the Butcher and Abdullah Jr. Kobayashi, Genesu Kobayashi, with Terry Boy using the spinning toehold finisher on Jr., the first bout of which was June 17th at Karakuen Hall and they did it again June 20th in Sapporo. Sabu and Super Leather, Mike Kirchner, did an angle on the June 16th FMW show in Shigaro where they split up their tag team and started a feud in a match against Riki Fuji and Masato Tanaka. 
Michinoku Pro is doing a World Masked Man League tournament from July 17 to August 22 with the finals in Sendai. UFO is reviving the Big Van Vader gimmick for a huge newcomer named Sylvester Turkey, who has worked some small shows in the Los Angeles R. Sylvester the Lunatic and because of his size and athletic background, has already signed a developmental deal with the WWF. He'll debut on the June 29 Osaka show against Eric Ulrich, wearing the old New Japan Vader gimmick with the headpiece with steam coming out of it. There was a lawsuit in Japan several years ago over intellectual property and it was ruled that Inoki owned the name Big Van Vader and the gimmick headgear. However, the name Vader itself was public domain because of the popularity of the character Darth Vader from Star Wars. Since that time, Leon White first went under the name Super Vader in Japan and has been simply Vader in the United States and now with all Japan. Turkey will be known as UFO Big Van Vader. They are really high on him because he's said to be the size of Undertaker or Kane but was a legit college wrestler and can do a moonsault. The problem is that name will be a killer for a green guy because of how great the original was and the natural comparisons that would be so unfavorable for a newcomer. If you recall, even a worker as great at Mitsuharu Misawa had trouble following Satoru Sayama as Tiger Mask although he was a success and has had a tremendous career, and Koji Kanemoto went and dropped the gimmick because he couldn't live up to the Sayama legend. Chikusa Nagio returned on June 20 for the Gia show at Karakuen Hall before a sellout 2000. The gimmick is that Nagio had to leave Gia for one month after her loss to Linus Asuka, and would face a mystery opponent chosen by Asuka, who turned out to be Atsuko Mita of the Neo Ladies promotion, and Nagio won the main event in only 19 seconds. They are building a return Nagio vs. Asuka match for Yokohama Bunka Gym, the site of their overflow sellout match on April 4, for September 15. Nagio and Asuka talk to the crowd for almost one hour building up the rematch. The stipulations are that if Nagio wins, she gets her company back and Asuka has to wrestle all the SSU women, her members called Superstar Unit, in no DQ matches. If Asuka wins, she keeps the company and Nagio has to join SSU as a young girl, which basically means she has to be Asuka's almost slave. War ran its 7th anniversary show on June 20th at Karakuen Hall before an announced full house of 2,100 with Tenryu headlining in two matches. In a Street Fight Tornado match main event, Tenryu and Nobutaka Araya and Shoji Nakamaki beat Atsushi Onida and Shigeo Okamura and Samba Asako when Tenryu pinned Okamura after a lariat. A rematch with most of these same wrestlers headlines Onida's Karakuen Hall show on June 27th. Also Tenryu teamed for the first time with Magnum Tokyo to beat Araya and Sumo Fuji when Tokyo pinned Fuji, with a shooting star press. Yuji Yasurioka, 32, who has been slowed for the past year with back and shoulder injuries, had his retirement match ending his seven-year career on the show teaming with Masaaki Mochizuki losing to the Osaka Pro Wrestling Team of Super Delphin, and now Hiro Hoshikawa. All Japan women pushed Momoe Nakanishi and Mio Wakazawa at a show on June 20th in Tokyo at their home offices. Wakazawa beat Manami Toyota in a Grand Prix match while Nakanishi held WWWA champion Yumiko Hata to a 30-minute draw also in a tournament match. Here and there. Pero Agueo headlined a World Wrestling Organization show on June 20th in San Jose for Father's Day and drew 1,600 fans to the fairgrounds on a show that didn't feature too many other big names, but got a big write-up in the San Jose Mercury as Agueo's final match in the city. Cody Michaels is putting on a benefit show for WCW referee Brian Hildebrand on July 30th in Rostraver, Pennsylvania. Hildebrand to help pay for some of his medical expenses, who is battling stomach cancer, is up to 109 pounds, he had been as low as 76 pounds not that many weeks ago, and should be returning to WCW for the Georgia Dome show on July 5th. There have been a lot of big names bandied about as far as appearing on the show but at press time the only names official are Shane Douglas, Cactus Jack, who started out training with Hildebrand some 16 years back under Dominic DiNucci, and Jim Cornette, who I believe he was friends with before either got started in wrestling and Hildebrand was Cornette's right-hand man in the Smoky Mountain wrestling days. They are going with the idea of Douglas versus Jack, if Jack's knees are ready and if politics doesn't get in the way given that Douglas will have probably signed with WCW by that time as there has also been talk of Douglas against a third wrestler with Jack as ref, as the announced main event and turning it into a three-way if Jack feels he can go that night, as a possible main event. Several of the SMW names from when Hildebrand worked there will probably attend along with Danucci, some WWF and WCW wrestlers if politics will not get in the way. On Memphis TV this week, they opened by saying after a lot of deliberation they had decided to ban Doug Gilbert because he's a loose cannon, and that Jerry Lawler would be returning.
As a shoot, due to numerous problems between the two a few years back Gilbert left some threats on Lawler's answering machine, that I don't think was general public knowledge but wasn't a secret either, and I guess they are trying to build that into an angle now that Gilbert is back with PPW. Baldo came back this week, now as Prince Albert saying that somebody was going to get pierced. They set up Albert versus Mike Tierney which saw Albert win when he went to pierce Tierney but J.R. Smooth's gang attacked Albert with his own piercing briefcase. Lawler came out with Stacy holding a Lawler for mayor sign. Lawler asked for people to email him for their feedback on whether he should run it and told people to bring Lawler for mayor signs to Raw. As you can see by the Raw show, it was almost embarrassing how few signs there were after Lawler asked people on television to bring them. Lawler said that he would make his announcement on whether he's running one way or another on the PPW show, which should be in a few weeks. He didn't bring up Gilbert. Wolfie D showed up, supposedly also uninvited saying he didn't understand why he didn't have a job with PPW. Smooth and Kalka and the rest of their group attacked D and Randy Hales and finally they let Gilbert in the door and he threw fire to save them but the fireball hit Hales and Gilbert was yelling at Hales saying it was all his fault and threw a garbage can on Hales. The show ended with another brawl with Smooth and Kulka versus Gilbert and D. There are plans for a live all-women's pay-per-view called Dangerous Curves using established women wrestlers as opposed to what today's audience has come to believe women wrestlers are, which would take place on August 29th in Las Vegas at the Riviera Hotel. We don't have any details on it other than the show itself was announced and that none of the wrestlers have been contacted about definitely appearing but feelers have been out. Pablo Marquez suffered a broken foot while wrestling in Puerto Rico for IWA and had two plates put in and will be out for a couple of months. There were incorrect internet, newsletter and magazine reports listing Pierre Roth Jr. as having wrestled on the June 11th WCW show in Buffalo but he was wrestling in Arroyo, Puerto Rico that night. Among the WWC recent angles are that Milo Huertas has turned heel joining with Chicky Star but they are already doing the deal where Star has pulled the wool over his eyes tricking Huertas, who is the younger brother of Invader No. 1 and telling him how his brother always kept him in prelims. Ray Gonzalez did an interview from the WWC video library and smashed what was supposedly the only tape of a famous Carlos Colon vs. Ric Flair match. Gonzalez now calls all the Puerto Rican fans Mexicans to get heat. Gonzalez is doing the heel front office gimmick threatening to fire the announcers for being boring. Colon officially vacated the Puerto Rican title belt since he's out with knee surgery. The NWA World Tag Team title switched hands twice this past week. Public Enemy won the belts beating Rick Fuller and Knuckles Nelson on June 17th in Bolton, Massachusetts but Eric Spraxia and Dukes Dalton beat Public Enemy on June 19th in Dorchester, Massachusetts to win them back. Spraxia and Nelson had held the belts going into this week. How those three facts make sense is anyone's guess, other than in today's wrestling, it doesn't have to. The plan at this point seems to be to keep the Brotherhood as NWA Tag Champs leading to the anniversary show on September 25th in Charlotte where there would be a tag team tournament that night with the winners getting a shot later in the show. The proposed and highly unlikely from the start Dory Funk vs. Terry Funk match is definitely off, and they are trying to get a major star from the past to face Dory in a Legends match. Indie wrestler Darren Wise appears on the E! Channel Howard Stern show on June 25th. Pennsylvania Championship Wrestling is doing a King of PCW tournament on August 14th in Hamburg, Pennsylvania with an eight-man tournament. Michael Modest will be working monthly shows starting at that point getting a title-level push. They will also be doing a tag team tournament on November 5th bringing in wrestlers from around the world including Venom Black and Phobia from Tijuana, Christian York, and Joey Matthews, Flash Flanagan and Glenn Osborne and Christopher Daniels and Reckless Youth. Terry Sapinski, The Warlord has a lawsuit outstanding over being in a 1996 auto accident that ended his wrestling career. Green Mountain Wrestling in Newport, Vermont on July 18th at the Municipal Building. Rocco Mazza, 37, who worked New Jersey Indies as a pro wrestling manager, is running for state assembly in New Jersey in a district that includes South Bergen as a Democrat. Mazza's campaign literature mentions nothing about pro wrestling. More notes on the situation where Ricky Nelson was fired by New Dimension Wrestling over an incident on June 3rd in Hickory, North Carolina. We're told Nelson didn't throw an 11-year-old down the stairs but a kid threw beer on Nelson and David Isley. Nelson grabbed the kid and told him to sit down. Nelson and Chris Plano didn't get into a fight, but had a backstage altercation where words were exchanged and the other wrestlers separated them. All Pro Wrestling runs July 3rd in Stockton, California at the Open Air Mall and July 10th in San Jose at Silver Creek High. The local evening magazine show aired a feature on APW and will be filming a feature about the wrestling school. MMA
K1 ran in Fukuoka on June 20 before a sellout 13,580 fans with Sam Greco winning the Wako Pro Muay Thai World Super Heavyweight title in a five-round decision over Mike Bernardo in what was reported as a really hot match. The win should elevate Greco to a very serious top guy caliber role in the fans' eyes since he's gotten wins over two of the big four, Bernardo and Ernesto Hust, in the last seven months. Musashi knocked out Kirkwood Walker of England in 150 of round one with a kick to win the Wako Pro Muay Thai World Heavyweight title while Masaaki Sadake won via TKO over Yogi Overholzer in 219 of the third round. However, Sadake re-broke his finger and will be out another two months. Promoter Kazuyoshi Ishii said on the show that he would be meeting with Don King in Las Vegas shortly. In a very interesting and intriguing match on June 20 in Amsterdam, Holland on a rings show, Gilbert Evel of rings scored a TKO over Semishal of Pancras in a match which drew a lot of attention in Japan because of the promotion versus promotion situation. The match should air in a few weeks on Japanese TV and was interesting because Evel is a tremendous striker and an exciting fighter in Schultz. Because of his reach being 6 foot 11, is very dangerous standing particularly with knees. It wound up with Evel dominating the standing even giving up the reach, but Schultz able to take him down and outmaneuver him on the ground. It was under rings rules in which a rope break was one point and a knockdown was two points and five points were allowed. Evel was when he scored his third knockdown, although at the time Schult had five rope escape points. So if this was under Pancrase rules where they only allow three points and knockdown and rope escapes count equally, Schult would have won the match. It has also been noted that Evel fought the match wearing shooting gloves and was allowed to punch with closed fist, which is usually against the rules in rings Japanese matches while Schult, going without gloves to help his grappling, had to keep his hands open. Several MMA fighters attempted to make the U.S. team in freestyle wrestling at the U.S. team trials on June 18th to 19th in Seattle. The first place finishers represent the U.S. in both the Pan American Games in July in Winnipeg and the World Championships in October in Ankara, Turkey. The highest placing was Mike Van Arsdale, who placed third at 187 pounds. Van Arsdale, who hasn't competed in either wrestling or MMA in several months since he's joined the army and gone through basic training and dropped a lot of weight. He was about 225 when he fought in UFC and in Brazil. Van Arsdale lost his first match 5-4 and came back with six wins in a row to take third. Frank Trigg, who has fought in Shudo and in many other events, didn't make weight at 167 so went up to 187 and lost to Van Arsdale and didn't place. Tom Erickson, who placed second to Bruce Baumgartner every year from 1990 to 1996 before winning when Baumgartner retired in 1997 and placing second last year, fell to fourth this year. Dan Severn returned to MMA in a show he promoted on June 19 in Manami, Minnesota beating Slade Martin in 337 with a key lock. Battlers pro wrestler Carl Greco, going by the name Carl Malenko, will face Egan Inoue on the July 4th Pride show at Yokohama Arena in the opening match. They also announced officially the Igor Vovchinchin vs. Carlos Barito match we wrote about last week. Pancras announced for July 6 that Karaku and Hall ranking matches with Semishult vs. Asami Shibuya for Schultz number 1 contender spot behind champ Yuki Kondo and Leon Dake vs. Keiichiro Yamamiya for Dake's number 5 spot. The next title match will be on the September 18th pay-per-view show which would be the 6th anniversary show from Tokyo Bay NK Hall. As of the latest listing, the UFC lineup for July 16th in Cedar Rapids, Iowa remains Marco Ruiz vs. Maurice Smith as the main event. There was some internal movement to change the main event for all the reasons suggested last week but the decision was made to stick with original plans. Pat Militic vs. Andre Pedroneris for the lightweight title, Tsuyashi Kosaka vs. Tim Lasik, Ebenezer Fontes Braga vs. Paul Jones, this match could be in jeopardy since Braga is facing Kazushi Sakuraba on the July 4th Pride show and there are rumors he's going to pull out of the show since Pride is the better paying gig. Hoyce Alger, a former college resting star out of Iowa who has won several MMA matches in a row for Extreme Challenge after losing his debut to Ensign Inoue in about 90 seconds on a UFC show, versus Eugene Jackson, Jeremy Horn against someone, apparently from Japan, and dark matches with Ron Waterman vs. Andre Roberts who has done some indie pro wrestling for Ed Sharkey, and David Dodd vs. Travis Fulton. Lasik has a 7-0 record with all wins coming via tap out, and is a former AAU national champion in wrestling, a two-time NCAA place winner in amateur wrestling and was 9-1 and in amateur boxing. Jackson is 13-2, with all wins coming via knockout or tap out and his two losses were to Vanderlei Silva via knockout and Tito Ortiz via decision, and won his weight class in the recent Boss Rutan Invitational. ECW. The proposed TNN deal has become the main topic of discussion. 
there has been no deal signed at press time although the plan still seems to be for ECW to debut on August 27th, with a first regular show and perhaps as early as August 20th for an introduction to the characters type of show. The New York Post item last week noting Rob Van Dam's interview in High Times magazine talking about smoking pot may have been a snag as the Las Vegas group which had been told weeks earlier they were out of the running and the decision was made to cut a deal with ECW was contacted after the article saying they weren't happy with the pub and suggesting the possibility of trying to put something together. Aside from that everything appears to be going smoothly although nobody will say anything for public comment until the deal is signed. There were also negotiations from ECW's side attempting to be able to possibly put the syndicated show on WGN, which is a long way from happening but they didn't want to close the doors on it as a possibility, which, since it's on the satellite and on many cable systems, could be seen by TNN as the same product on a competitor's station. Reports last week regarding the taping schedule were apparently premature. There are no set-in-stone plans regarding how the taping of the two shows will be done. Probably some weeks they'll tape two hours, one of syndication and one for TNN, all of course dependent upon the deal being closed, in the same building. Some weeks they'll tape one hour in two different buildings and possibly some weeks even tape two hours for TNN in the same building. The proposed TNN show would be of a far higher production values live than the ECW syndicated shows currently are, but the show may wind up being post-edited instead of being taped as if it's a live show like a taped episode of Raw. There will be almost no weeks where ECW tries to run five house shows as when the idea was broached with the crew, nobody, as in nobody, felt they physically could be able to survive working five days per week. The plan is for either three or four show weekends except on pay-per-view weekends where there would be only one show. The schedule for the year 2000 is for six pay-per-view events, but there is a possibility depending on a lot of factors of increasing it to eight, and in months without a pay-per-view, producing a tape pay-per-view similar to what WCW does with its home videos and what UFC has done with its best of and recent Shamrock show, probably starting in either October or December. The July 18th pay-per-view lineup from Dayton is still a skeleton show, with the only two definite matches being Van Damme vs. Balls Mahoney for the TV title and a three-way with Little Guido, Super Crazy, and Yoshihiro Tajiri. There will probably be a tag match with Just Incredible and Lance Storm vs. Jerry Lynn and someone else, plus a singles title defense for Taz and a tag title defense for the Dudleys. The idea is not to shoot any big angles or make any big changes until the new TV season at which point Van Damme will be pushed as the top guy and building to him winning the heavyweight title Incredible and Storm will start their push to the tag title. The remainder of the summer is to elevate Lynn Storm, Credible and Mahoney while keeping Van Damme strong as the top guy and keeping Taz, Sabu and the Dudleys in their current position. The June 17th debut in the Chicago market with the show in Villa Park, Illinois was a big success with a hot sellout crowd of 3,000. Reports we got were it was a very strong debut show. Little Guido was given a win over Tajiri when Sal E. Graziano interfered. They did an angle where Credible and Storm asked Jerry Lynn to join their team but Lynn turned them down and pinned Credible in a match where the winner would face Van Dam in the main event. After the match Storm and Credible attacked Lynn and left him laying so he couldn't face Van Dam after all. Christopher Daniels debuts and pinned Mosco de la Merced in about one minute, leading to a match where he beats Super Crazy. Live reports indicated Daniels Crazy as the best match on the show, Guido vs. Tajiri as second, but Paul Heyman was disappointed in it and decided against airing it on television, as it was being taped for. Daniels did an interview saying that if you're 200 pounds and from Mexico they call you a luchador, if you're 200 pounds and from Japan they call you an international superstar and if you're 200 pounds an American, you get a needle in your ass as quick as you can. Daniels will be working here for the next month, at which time he returns to Japan for a Michinoku tour. They taped an angle where Taz challenged anyone to come out and face him. A guy dressed like Hogan in the crowd took all the heat so they had to tape the angle all over again. Steve Corino and Jack Victory came out and it wound up with Rhino Richards facing and losing to Taz. The Dudleys did their usual mic work before their match with the Hogan guy getting a lot of crowd attention. Another fan threw a chair at them and wound up hitting ref Jim Molyneux. Bubba ran into the stands after the fan and it threatened to be a bad scene since Bubba challenged anyone in the crowd to throw another chair. Luckily the chairs were hooked together in rows as fans who tried to break their chairs away couldn't very quickly. Balls and Spike Dudley came out leading to a tag match where both were put through a table and lost. Van Dam ended up beating Storm in the main event when Lynn helped Van Dam. Credible came out and Sabu ended the show cleaning house. Sabu must be some kind of a nut as he flew from Tokyo to Chicago just to do the run-in at the end of the show, then immediately flew back to finish his FMW tour. Jazz was at the show. 
The deal is that she moved to New York from Louisiana, but wasn't making enough money to live on so moved back and since she's not in the area, isn't going to be flown in for East Coast shots. Van Damme is changing his work style from all high spots with little if any psychology to more of a Ricky Morton babyface who sells for a long time and makes comebacks. He still is said to need work on getting fire for his comebacks to make the style work. Tommy Dreamer actually has a herniated disc in his back. Vader was informally contacted about working with Taz on the pay-per-view. I don't believe this even got as far as Paul Heyman. It doesn't appear likely because Vader made it clear that due to his position in all Japan, he can't do any jobs in ECW and they're looking to find people Taz can beat, preferably someone with a name. The other show was June 18th in South Bend, Indiana selling out a 900-seat building. There may be a confusion in the marketplace lawsuit on the horizon with a group calling itself Extreme Pro Wrestling, XPW, debuting on July 31st in Reseda, California although I guess you can't trademark the word extreme for use in wrestling any more than you can trademark the term wrestling for use in wrestling. That group is going to be more heavily into porn stars including a Miss Extreme contest among some noted porn stars featuring stars from Extreme Associates, which is involved with a promotion, and vivid video, hosted by adult film star Tom Byron. The TV show this past week was from Columbia, South Carolina, talked about throughout the show as the historic Township Auditorium which housed Mid-Atlantic Wrestling for years. The poor lighting made the show seem like a throwback in time to the 70s as well. Mahoney has had his hair and trimmed but also lightened to try and make him look more like Cactus Jack. Perino did the same mic work he does every week, including the appendix gag which was really funny at first and is probably good on the live show but it's dead on television. Before Taz could kill Corino, Spike came out and Taz said he'd defend the title against him in a Falls Count Anywhere match. It was heavily edited to showing big bumps outside the ring, mainly taken by Spike, including a powerbomb through a table and a suplex on his head before the choke finish. It seemed good based on what aired and both shook hands after the match. Lynn vs. David Cash was also heavily edited with Lynn winning. Couldn't tell if the match was good but enough aired to show that Cash has a lot of potential. It's too bad with WWF and WCW trying to sign everyone in sight to developmental deals either if they are tall and or take roids and or are good looking for WWF, and God only knows what criteria WCW knows but judging from the power plant guys that have broken in unless you're roided out of your mind it seems they run you off at a guy like Cash because he's small never gets a shot. Crazy was scheduled against Tajiri but Graziano destroyed Tajiri with a splash through the table. It wound up with Guido vs Crazy which was the weekly really good TV match. Guido had crazy in the crab when Tajiri came back making his Mr. Saito faces. Jim Molino then announced it would be a three-way dance. Ten seconds later crazy pinned Guido after three moonsaults, and literally seconds after that, Tajiri pinned crazy after a brainbuster. The finish made the match a big letdown. Credible challenged the Dudleys to a tag title match. After Credible was taken out of the picture, the main event was Van Damme vs. D. Vaughn. Fans were chanting show your tits in the middle of the high spots and considering who was at ringside, I'm assuming it must have been for a fan in the audience unless people wanted to see Bubba without his shirt on. Credible Kane Bubba and he juiced. Van Dam did an awesome plancha. This match was also heavily edited. Ref bump. Bubba got involved. The Dudleys did a messed up double team power bomb on RVD. Mahoney came out with hard chair shots to both Dudleys and held the chair for Van Dam to deliver the Van Daminator and lead to the high frog splash with balls putting on the ref shirt and counting the pin. The fans were really into the finish. Unfortunately, we had to see Molino lie there without a shirt on, but it was infinitely better than seeing Prince Albert wearing panties on Raw. To set up the beginning of their program, Mahoney hit Van Dam with a chair and laid him out just as the show went off the air. WCW the plan at this point for the Bash of the Beach show on July 11th in Fort Lauderdale looks to be Sting and Nash vs. Savage and Sid Vicious, the only match finalized at this point, plus, Kurt Hennig and Bobby Duncombe Jr. and Barry and Kendall Windham vs. Conan and Mysterio Jr. and Swollen and Brad Armstrong with Master P in the corner, plus a tag team title match which I guess under the new retarded stipulations all tag title matches are now 3 on 2 with Bigelow and Page and Canyon vs. Benoit and Saturn and also Piper vs. Bagwell and Flair vs. Malenko. Aside from the main event, all the other matches are in the discussion stages, rather than official. The most recent pay-per-view Great American Bash, fell to an 0.43 buy rate. It's very possible for June that WWS June pay-per-view, King of the Ring, will triple the buys of WCWs. That 0.43 would be the fifth lowest buy rate in the history of the company which dates back more than 85 pay-per-view shows in all incomes during what is supposed to be the hottest period in wrestling history.
The ones that did worse were Beach Blast in 1992, Steiners vs. Terry Gordy and Steve Williams, Great American Bash in 1992, Gordy and Williams vs. Dustin Rhodes and Barry Windham, Battle Bowl in 1993, Battle Royal, and Starcade 1995. Flair vs. Savage Eric Bischoff met with Barry Bloom this past week as there was some fairly significant concern of what Bill Goldberg would say about WCW on the Dennis Miller HBO show on June 18th. As it was, he didn't say anything negative. Miller was very positive on wrestling in general, saying it's a great activity for a father to take his son to and that he and his kids had the time of their lives when they went to see the last WCW event at the forum. Actually he never said it was a WCW event, and how nice all the wrestlers were and brought up Flair in particular. He was totally defensive of all criticism about wrestling answering it by saying you can't blame America's woes on wrestling. Miller brought up Austin not necessarily because of the Tonight Show challenge but because he'd heard of him and didn't seem to understand the politics, the different companies and the promotion war, and Goldberg changed the subject. Goldberg talked more about football than wrestling and did complain about the schedule in general, saying that it was a blessing he got the knee surgery because at least it gave him some rest. He never complained about WCW or his treatment and sort of hinted he could be at Nitro as early as this week, although he never was planned on being there but it got the internet going. Actually, Jim Ross did the same thing, on his story on the WWF website, he said he's heard rumors on the internet that Goldberg would show up in the audience on the live Raw when none with any credibility existed in the first place, and denied them which of course meant rumors started flying everywhere that he would. He was pretty hard on Flair, at one point saying he was really 70 years old and also joked about their match in Minneapolis after Goldberg speared him and lifted him up for the slam, said that Flair whispered in his ear, remember two things. I'm a 50-year-old man and I love you. Hogan apparently referenced Goldberg on a Detroit radio station saying there was this guy in the company who was given this incredible push but he didn't have much experience and how he's self-destructing before our eyes. It appears that WCW has almost completely given up on signing Chris Jericho, which probably more than anything else is the epitome of what a losing company it has turned into when one of its two most marketable talents for the long term, the other being Goldberg, isn't even attempted to be signed because certain people have others ears saying he's never drawn money or whatever stupid things guys who have never drawn money themselves, and those that have in the past, say got people lower on the card and with more talent than they have. A pitch was made in the last few days to keep him with the idea of being in the young versus old feud, which is still another mid-card program at this point, only a way of moving Flair and Piper down the cards. Titan is pitching Jericho on the idea he's going to be the next Shawn Michaels. Hopefully with a better wardrobe. Bischoff, when asked about Arn Anderson's feelings on signing Sid, said that while Anderson may be personally uncomfortable, this is a business and from a business standpoint Anderson said he'd do whatever he had to. Bischoff said of Sid, it became clear to me he has matured over the past five years. He realizes he made mistakes in and out of the ring and recognizes the tremendous opportunity he has here. So far, he has conducted himself very professionally. I've got all the confidence in the world that he's learned from his mistakes. If it doesn't work out, Sid's options are really limited. I think he's matured to the point that he understands that. Bischoff also claimed in the interview with Alex Merves in the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel that he had never talked with Sable. Speaking of Sable, Nash was upset after his interview on Nitro last week because Sable stole the spotlight and fans were chanting for her while he was out there doing his interview. Wasn't the whole idea of her being brought out at the same time to give Nash the illusion of being a ratings draw since Sable had been the biggest draw so far this year? Even a bigger flop than recent Nitros in WCW's new multi-million dollar It's Out There image campaign. For example, this week's Sports Illustrated has a full-page color ad showing Bagwell posing with a WCW logo. It doesn't even advertise Nitro's starting time or the date of the next pay-per-view. Bischoff went to West Memphis, Arkansas on June 10th to finalize the deal with Vicious. WCW wants Bret Hart to return for the July 5th Georgia Dome show. Actually the company has already put out word that's when Hart returns. Hart does have the potential to come back and be a huge babyface star, but it doesn't really matter because they had the chance in January to do the same thing if they had promoted the movie and instead chose to ignore the movie and Nick's ideas that would have saved their investment in him and instead decided to keep him off TV for several weeks after the movie in case fans were to cheer him. Bischoff told Hart to take as long as he wants to come back. Hart, at least as of a few days ago, had not actually made a decision whether or not to wrestle again although everyone seems to expect that eventually he's coming back. WCW is going to bring in the rap band Naughty by Nature to perform at the Georgia Dome Nitro, but Master P flexed his muscle and got it next. Dennis Rodman is also scheduled to debut on that show. 
Rodman isn't scheduled to appear on the pay-per-view and the only in-ring wrestling appearance on his five-show deal is to wrestle in Sturgis. Nitro at the Superdome in New Orleans drew 17,249, which was 15,593 paying $346,424. Realistically they were going to draw about 13 to 14,000 paid without all the late local push by Master P. So much for him coming in and selling out the dome. It wasn't totally evident on TV because they had a lot of plants at ringside and in a section dancing that the cameras focused on while he was out there, but the fans didn't pop for him live and his segments were not only awful, which was no surprise, but they also weren't over in the least to the predominantly white WCW audience. Show opened with Savage, Sid and the girls getting out of the Humvee. Nash showed up in a limo and chased the Humvee since the driver was still in there. Nash should never put himself in a position that requires running because it kills the image, and that's all the guy has left, if that. Master P came out and sang and the less said about that the better. They showed Lodi and Lenny Lane backstage, doing he first angle to set up the idea of them doing a gay tag team. That did wonders for too much in the WWF. Kidman and CC Kosis in a 06. They were having a really good match when Savage and Sid ran in and treated them like jobbers. They were beating on them with Kidman just being a run-of-the-mill job guy until Sting made the save and they ran off. Nash showed up and blamed Sting for being the driver because they ran away and also because he came out of the Hummer last week but Sting said he wasn't. Meng beat Lane in 255 with a Tongan death grip. Really bad. Great way to begin a new push for Lane. They did an angle where it was Master P's brother's birthday. Conan and Mysterio Jr. weren't even out there to get the rub although it was just as well they weren't because this was an incredibly bad angle. Hennig came out, and now is talking like a Texan. Master P still hasn't figured out his name and just knows he's a cowboy. He gave P's brother a cowboy hat, which he stomped into the ground and they threw the birthday cake on Hennig. They couldn't even get that right. Eddie Guerrero returned to zero fanfare and pinned Juventud Guerrero with the frog splash in 1133. Boy was nothing made out of Eddie's return. Juvie was awesome in this match and Eddie is a great wrestler so it was good overall. Eddie was noticeably slower and seemed gun-shy and totally lacking fire in his first match back. Fans weren't into it either and it's long established that unless it's the TV main event, you can't do matches that long in competitive situations because the audience doesn't have the attention span for it. Ernest Miller pinned Prince Aokia after kicking him with the dreaded red shoe in 426. Unbelievably bad, but so is every cat match. The kick itself looked good but that was the only thing. Booker T beat Canyon in 1711 when Page and Bigelow did a run-in. The fans were into it early as both worked hard. The audience lost interest even though Canyon pulled a lot of good moves out. Canyon after the match gave T a flatliner on the title belt and then Page and Bigelow gave him a double-team diamond cutter. A Flair and Piper interview first turned into a handicap match with both against Bagwell. Piper is trying to call the younger group the Y2K kids. Actually Piper was totally hilarious for the first time maybe this decade in cutting a promo on Buff. Unfortunately, he looked terrible once the match started. But with Flair in there, it was a good match and had more heat than anything on the show. Malenko ran in to even things up but the ref ordered him to leave. So Malenko got in the corner like he was the tag partner and tagged in. Makes perfect sense to me. Believe it or not when Malenko tagged in the match fell asleep as he mistimed spots badly with Piper and even with Flair. Malenko put Anderson in the cloverleaf and Anderson was tapping, makes sense to me by this point in the show, but Piper hit Bagwell with an object and Flair pinned him in 10-18. Then in a tag title match, Conan and Mysterio Jr. beat Page and Bigelow and Canyon via DQ in 12-36. They explained that since Page's team has the belts that all three can tag in. While this was going on then No Limit Soldiers, Chase Tatum and Brent Armstrong and Swollen, were in Conan's corner and never lifted a finger to stop these unfair odds. It was bad enough seeing Mysterio Jr. in the ring with any of those tall guys. The Wyndham's Hennig and Duncombe all ran in for the DQ and then Master P and more of the No Limit soldiers along with Benoit and Saturn all showed up and had a wild brawl. The African-American guy with the gigantic arms is Teddy the Tank Reed, an indie wrestler from New York who previously worked for WWF as Mike Tyson's bodyguard and has signed a one-year deal with WCW. Sting beat Sid via DQ in 6-11. Most of the match was stalling to avoid a lockup. Of course Savage and the girls interfered for the DQ and Luger made the save. Another terrible main event. Luger couldn't even keep a straight face as this finish looked so disorganized because it was. Even with the good in-ring wrestling by Guerrera, Kidman, and Sikosis, which is positioned as to it not mattering anyway and nobody even notices it anymore, this was a complete flop as a show.
Scott Steiner's back is said to be in such bad shape that there is even talk he may not be long for this business. For June 4th in the UK Raw drew 280,000 viewers to 400,000 for Nitro and 300,000 for Thunder. Raw was moved actually to a stronger station and better time slot, but I guess fans being creatures of habit, didn't all pick up on the change the first weekend. Willie Nelson is expected to do a WCW vignette with Hennig. Certain people are recognizing Hennig is about to turn face against their wishes, so they are going to do a deal where Hennig tries to buddy up to Nelson but he shoots him down trying to get the country fans to think of Hennig as being uncool as well. Because they didn't tape enough matches at the taping in Syracuse, New York, WCW had to replay the eight-man tag from Nitro involving Bagwell pinning Flair in its entirety as the Thunder main event. Mike Weber, who worked in promotions, quit the company to take a job in motorsports. Dusty Rhodes returned as an announcer on WCW Saturday night and was gruesome. I need a damn thesaurus to keep finding new words to describe WCW. Anyway, he babbled on incoherently even more than before, not allowing Mike Tenay or Scott Hudson to say a thing and ruined the few matches on the show that were actually good by ignoring them. Rhodes won't be on this Saturday which is a one-hour show which means the ratings will drop because one-hour shows always do worse numbers, and will be back on July 3rd. Jericho did concerts with a band called Fozzie Osborne in Gainesville and Atlanta as lead singer and people said he was good. He said both rap and country suck and heavy metal rules. If he could have kept his drug problems under control he'd have probably been the best worker in the business by this point. That's heavy metal, not Jericho I'm talking about. Bigelow had a lot of excess fluid in his spine and needed an epidural needle to drain it so missed shows last week including not being able to wrestle on the pay-per-view. Charles Robinson ended up with four cracked vertebrae in his upper back from Savage landing with so much weight on his chest doing the big elbow in that television match. When he can come back, the idea is to turn it into an angle, but that'll mean more Flair vs. Savage matches which nobody wants to see. Steve Regal has been training at the power plant. Shannon Moore and Shane Helms, who have been impressive for several indies including Music City and lots of Carolina's groups, also signed with WCW and are training at the power plant. There were also rumors flying everywhere that Shane Douglas would be at Nitro this week. That was never the plan nor was he even at the show but all it takes is one mention and literally everyone in the company thought it was true. I don't believe Douglas has even signed yet although most everyone expects it's inevitable that he will, and that Bischoff will have him do the program with Flair anyway. Disco Inferno was asked to do a program with Van Hammer but he thought it was worthless. Savage doesn't want to have anything to do with the old guys young guys feud because he doesn't want to be positioned as an old guy. Ted DiBiase was at the June 7th Nitro in Cleveland doing the backstage blast. Isn't it amazing that Nash is the first booker in history that has ever been able to kill both Piper and Flair. Even Piper's best efforts for the past 12 years couldn't kill him. New Orleans was the only WCW show of the past week. WWF. The live Raw drew a sellout 15,757 paying $282,446 to the Pyramid in Memphis. Before Raw started they did a series of matches with WWF developmental and other contracted talent to see how they are progressing. Kurt Angle beat Matt Hardy, who had Michael Hayes in his corner. Al Snow beat Vic Grimes. Mike Tierney beat Robbie D. Glenn Kolka beat Godfather via DQ and finally Chris Cannonball beat Blue Meanie. The live show started with Triple H and China challenging Undertaker. Taker came out but Vince and the CM and told them they wouldn't wrestle tonight or any night. Vince talked about Austin dumping the manure in Vince's office, and the smell was still there. Didn't WCW do the angle in a limo? And if Austin got Vince's job as CEO, wouldn't Austin be working in Vince's office anyway? Weren't those Vince's secretaries last week that were now Austin's secretaries? Austin came out and they argued leading to Shawn Michaels coming out wearing these shorts that look like a fashion disaster from the 80s. Now that Shawn is married, doesn't he ask his wife before leaving the house if his attire makes him look like this outdated gay guy? Actually by the time this show was over, after seeing Al Snow pick his nose and typecast his career forever by eating it and seeing Prince Albert in underwear that only looks good on young very slim women who are in great shape, and last I checked, he fit into none of those categories, I guess Shawn fell into the normal category. Then Patterson and Briscoe came out and asked Michaels for a match with Vince and Shane. This segment ended with Shamrock hitting Viscera with a chair and Patterson and Briscoe dancing to HBK's ring entrance which was absolutely hilarious. A three-way with Jarrett, Shamrock and Test for the IC title saw Jarrett pin Shamrock after Steve Blackman returned as a heel and hit Shamrock with several kendo stick shots in 227. 
Rock pinned Edge after the people's elbow in 332. Rock was incredibly over and the match had great heat because of it. Undertaker ran in after the match and gave Rock a tombstone pile driver. Viscera beat Mark Henry in 211 in the body slam challenge. This was even lamer that it sounded on paper. Henry climbed the ropes for no reason and basically jumped off with Viscera underneath and they called it a slam. On TV the night before they said the only way to win was to gorilla press, press overhead, your opponent which even for a guy as strong as Henry the first guess would be a physical impossibility to do with a 500-pound man. After the match D'Lo Brown ran in and they did a double-team slam on Viscera and that didn't look good either. Midian that hit the ring and laid out both guys with a title belt. They did a deal where they were doing a Beaver and Mrs. Cleaver interview and Beaver walked out saying he couldn't do it. You heard a voice yell Chaz the first name they call him this is life, and then Lawler and Ross acted embarrassed about the match being cancelled. This was a cute way to dump the gimmick. I'd hate to think they did it for one of those subliminal messages regarding Owen Hart as people have suggested, but that is also the way the mindset there does sometimes seem to think. Austin pinned Boss Man in 633 with a stunner. During the match Austin shoved Vince off a ladder that he was standing on for no reason so he took a bump onto the announcer's table, which didn't break. After the match the CM Vince and Shane all attacked Boss Man for losing the match. Venus came out and made some reference to Bruce Pritchard, there are too many weird Pritchard sightings in the back of camera shots where the time he ran out to get those beach balls so they must be building for something, and then attacked Fat Albert, handcuffed Droz to the post and Albert to the ropes, pulled down his trunks this 350-pound man was wearing something he shouldn't be caught dead in and Venus did this fake tattoo of a W on his butt which was supposed to be VV I guess. Mr. Ass and Acolytes beat Road Dog and X-Pac and Kane in 105 when Billy pinned X-Pac with a Famouser on a chair. X-Pac asked for the tag titles to be up in a six-man tag, which after seeing WCW, made perfect sense. Billy accepted, which got the Acolytes mad, and to make sure this angle played out to its most nonsensical conclusion, the heels won anyway. Snow picked his nose and ate it for no reason other than in somebody's eyes it makes for entertaining television. Big Show beat Holly in a hardcore match when they were fighting in the parking lot and Big Show threw a small car off a two-foot embankment and pinned Holly. Ross didn't even try to sell the possibility that the car fell on Holly even though it was clear that was what he was supposed to be saying and it was also clear it came nowhere close. Patterson and Briscoe beat Vince and Shane via DQ. Patterson and Briscoe opened doing a double Goldberg spear. Goldberg has nothing to worry about. Actually for the first time, I guess because he was working with Vince who isn't a worker, Patterson looked pretty bad out there. Vince ran away and left his son by himself. What a cool dad. They were mopping the floor with Shane when Rodney Lionheart or whatever his name is and Pete Gass ran in with a third guy, who is obviously a trained worker and they destroyed both Patterson and Briscoe's ankles. Ross made an inside comment about Patterson's boyfriend during the match. Undertaker beat Triple H in a title match via DQ in 638. Match had no heat, which makes Taker's second straight live title match main event to have no heat on TV. The crowd started chanting steroids. I'm not sure who his was for, my guess would be China but of the four, I'd guess it wasn't for Paul Bearer. Rock ran in for the DQ and laid out Taker. A Brahma bull came from the ceiling and the CM attacked Rock, but Bossman made the save and everyone ran off leaving Rock with Bearer and he handcuffed him, but they didn't raise him. Given Paul Bearer's weight, the last thing they needed to do was raise him to the ceiling this week. The WWF is attempting to unload the former Debbie Reynolds Hotel. The story is they need to sell it because it's too small for what they want, wouldn't they know what they wanted when they bought it in the first place? And want to buy a property on the as yet undeveloped northern part of the Vegas Strip. Others are claiming they can't publicly admit to a mistake and they need to unload it because there was a reason nobody else bid high for the property. WWF The music fell to number 113 in the charts selling 11,707 CDs. Rick Riley in Sports Illustrated has criticized WWF the past two weeks for not stopping the show after Hart died. Brian Christopher will be undergoing major knee surgery with Dr. James Andrews on June 24, and likely be out until the end of the year. Inside Edition did a story on China. Mick Foley is working on his autobiography while recuperating from knee surgery. The book is expected to hit the shops on September 20. There are also autobiographies of Steve Austin and Rock planned to be released this year. Speaking of autobiographies, I was at a bookstore this past week and saw the Ventura book already in the discount bin. Foley will also be doing a promotional tour of Australia in July. Sunday Night Heat on June 20th in Nashville was the kind of booking that takes about 5 seconds of thought process. They did two four corners elimination matches and had the winners advanced to a singles match. They basically 
didn't give any thought to finishes. Gun Shamrock, Sho and Kane saw Kane and Sho both counted out in 2.30. Shamrock vs. Gun was fairly good ending when Shamrock shoved ref Tim White for no reason other than they couldn't figure out how to put Gun over in 8.24. Shamrock put Gun in the ankle lock after and chased some refs around. The second four corners match was Dog, X Pac, Holly, and China. X Pac was great as usual. So he got pedigree by Triple H outside the ring and Holly pinned him in 145. Dog had Holly pinned when China hit both guys with a chair and put Holly on top of Dog for the pin at 550, and then she pinned Holly in 554. This left China versus Gun and Triple H gave him the pedigree on the floor as well, so China pinned him in 145. That leads one to believe that Gun will win core. The rest of the show was teasing Taker vs. Triple H for Raw the next night. WWF tried to get Austin on Jay Leno to respond to Goldberg. The Leno people said it would be great if he accepted, but when Titan, through Marissa McMahon, told them he wasn't going to accept, they didn't want him on the show. The June 26 MSG main event has been switched from Undertaker vs. Big Show to the same Undertaker vs. Austin they are doing in all the house shows. On the New York television this week, since MSG and the next Meadowlands on July 31st are already sold out, they were pushing an MSG date on August 28th. House shows saw June 18th in Dallas at Reunion Arena for an event that sold out weeks in advance draw 17,704 paying $445,520 which breaks the all-time gate record set in that market way back in 1984 of $402,000 for the famous Flair vs. Kerry Von Eric match at Texas Stadium. June 19th in Houston drew a sellout 15,971 paying $423,986 and the heat tapings on June 20th in Nashville drew a sellout 12,651 paying $295,132. Dallas and Houston did the same Austin over Undertaker via DQ in the title match, Shamrock over Jarrett via Countout in a title match, Acolytes over Kane and X-Pac, Big Show over Triple H and Rock over Bossman in a night stick on a pole match. Merchandise for the week was $427,412 or $6.88 per head. Mike Rapata, Colorado Kid in Music City is expected to sign a developmental deal this week. Pro Wrestling had 18 of the 20 best-selling sports videos in the June 19th Billboard. Of those 12 were WWF including the top 5, top 2 of which remain Austin. WCW's new releases of Nash and NWO4 Life debuted at number 6 and number 7. A&E home video of the unreal story of pro wrestling cracked the charts at number 11. Line of the week from Jackal's Winnipeg Sun column, I bet Bill Clinton is glad he never met Sable. That's right up there with the internet speculation on who drove the Humvee being Jerry Flynn, with Hoovy passed out on the floorboards. The Reader's Pages Owen Hart Thanks for your excellent Owen Hart obituary. It was truly sad to be there live in Kansas City. There have been far too many deaths in wrestling in the past few years, but this was much worse. A clean living family man dying over something so stupid. The tribute show was very nice, even if it was only damage control on Vince McMahon's part. It really sucked that they didn't stop the show. We traveled more than 600 miles to see it. How were we supposed to enjoy it? But it was even worse watching the replay on television. A man dies and Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler have to sell Vince having a broken ankle. They show Triple H smashing up a casket. Continuing the show live was bad enough, but the context of the television show made it ten times worse. There was no sensitivity whatsoever. My friend, who didn't go to Kansas City or watch the pay-per-view was ready to quit watching wrestling over it. Owen was never the top guy in the company but he was the favorite of many and will be missed. Steve Lockwood Shoreview, Minnesota I was amazed at the coverage Owen Hart has received for his untimely death. He was an awesome wrestler in the late 80s and early 90s. He was a genuinely nice guy when I met him in 1996, and was very pleased when I told him how I enjoyed his matches against Pegasus Kid, Jushin Liger and others. It's very hard to summarize a person's life, career and personality, but you did an awesome job. I don't blame the industry for this freak accident. The stunt has been done in wrestling, concerts and theatrical events regularly. Unfortunately, now it has taken a life, which is very rare when it's done properly. I don't agree that a war for ratings caused the accident but it's not my place or anyone else's for that matter, to criticize how a grieving family is coping with an unmeasurable loss they have to deal with. Eric Bimbin. Howard Beach, New York. I've been a fan of wrestling for about 10 years. My first exposure came when I was 8 years old when I'd watch prime time wrestling on Monday nights. My two favorite wrestlers at the time were Mr. Perfect and the Blue Blazer. I'd wait all night just to see Owen Hart's unbelievable acrobatics. 
He was so different from seeing Hulk Hogan's leg drop and Rick Rude's neckbreaker. I have to say it was Owen Hart's style that got me into being a wrestling fan. But it wasn't until years later when I would see Japanese footage that I realized he was a world-class athlete. Vince McMahon's attempt to please the fans with the Raw Tribute show was a good idea, but it shouldn't have been used to get Stone Cold Steve Austin's character over. I don't blame Titan Sports for this accident because it was an unfortunate accident. However, I do believe there are going to be serious repercussions on this industry. Todd Ferretti, Scranton, Pennsylvania. The Owen Hart issue is your best one, written almost like how Stephen King did The Green Mile, with the past and present intertwined. It was weird reading a few weeks back about how the ever-changing lineup for Over the Edge, a few weeks ago had Godfather defending against Owen Hart, and not the Blue Blazer. If only the bookers hadn't messed with that lineup. Vinnie Carolyn. Stoughton, Massachusetts. With all due respect to the tremendous job that you do covering all aspects of the wrestling business in both good times and bad, the reprinting of Bret Hart's article on Owen that ran in the Canadian newspapers on Memorial Day was the most moving piece of work that has appeared in these pages since I've been a subscriber. It is the most memorable section ever to appear in the newsletter. I would take an awfully hard heart to read it without having to pause and take a deep breath. I couldn't do it so far and I don't think I ever will be able to. Sean Flanagan. Los Angeles, California. I've read how your readers felt having to watch the news of Owen Hart's death on pay-per-view. I understand their feelings and everyone grieves in a different way. They're live. I saw this body falling to the ring apron which sounded like a gun going off at Kemper Arena. The impact of the fall was devastating. I saw a body lay motionless with paramedics in the ring doing a trauma code which only US Live saw. My stomach began to churn and get really nauseated, may hair stood up on my arms and my body turned very cold, empty and scared to watch. In the arena, everyone was stunned and stood for 15 minutes seeing Owen lay lifeless and watching his face turn blue in front of us. I knew Owen was gone when he was carried out. You always hear of tragedies but you never know how you would react. I had tears after the show. Everyone leaving the building was in a state of shock and quiet. Even out of the building with the local TV crews there, fans said that it couldn't really be true. I was sick and started to shake just thinking about what I saw on my three-and-a-half-hour drive home. Your readers don't understand what it was like to be there. I hope nobody ever has to go through it. Bruce Grummert. Omaha, Nebraska. In remembering Owen Hart, I've been watching his mid-90s matches with Bret Hart, Davey Boy Smith, and Shawn Michaels. I hadn't realized until recently just how much wrestling has changed. I know the soap opera style is successful, but the actual wrestling in comparison is dire. All the WWF title matches start briefly in the ring, go to the entranceway, brawl around the commentary table, someone goes through the Spanish announcer's table and they go back in the ring for the screwed job finish. The four and a quarter star rating for Steve Austin vs. Rocket Backlash was warranted in one way, but it was the same match we've seen a dozen times before. I was watching Brett vs. Owen at WrestleMania 10. The crowd heat was unbelievable for the finish. My father, who is a very casual fan, noticed the difference immediately. I know things are very different today, but if they had workers of the heart's caliber in the main event today's, the lack of crowd heat may not be so much of a problem. Today's main events are all too similar and too predictable. With the use of steroids rapidly back on the rise, it will be a long time before great workers are on top again. Maybe another steroid scandal will change things. It probably will eventually happen, but it's a shame it takes something like that to focus on the in-ring product. You were so right in 1992 when you write that Vince McMahon and the industry as a whole wouldn't learn one thing from their mistakes. The proof is right in front of our eyes every Monday night. Ben Craig. Stockport, England. I've come around to your way of thinking regarding cancelling the pay-per-view. The baseball rainout analogy put everything into perspective, not to mention the way the Houston Astros handled the incident with Larry Dierker. I would still like to see exactly what input the police had that night but if the police had ordered the show to continue, I'm sure the Hart family wouldn't have made certain comments. I really don't feel any remarks regarding this accident by Eric Bischoff at this point have any credibility. When it first happened, he was hemming and hawing on Larry King. He was afraid to question McMahon's decision. Now that WWF has been so roundly criticized by others, he feels it's safe to be hypercritical. He should just keep his mouth shut, especially since some of his wrestlers are walking time bombs. Vic Stanley. Chicago, Illinois. I walked around with it for a few weeks because I didn't want to admit how much it truly hurt. I didn't want to show just how much emotion I've invested in pro wrestling for 20 years. But as I finally sat down and watched Raw, it all came out. 
I was crying uncontrollably and it just kept coming the entire show. It's so obvious coming out of this horribly needless tragedy that Owen Hart was an anomaly in this business. In a profession that delivers fantasy and swerves as its reality, he swerved everyone by being real. To me, it makes no difference whether Raw was meant to be a PR cover-up over the nature of his death. For the most part, it was obvious that for the wrestlers and the announcers, and especially for me as a wrestling fan, it was a chance to say goodbye to a wonderful human being who also happened to be a wrestler. Being newly married and beginning a family, I can only imagine the loss of a husband to Martha and a father to Uya and Athena. My heart and my prayers are with you and the entire Hart family. Owen was obviously a bringer of light and love. May his light always shine in your hearts. Gabriel Daigle. Long Beach, California. In regards to the May 31st issue, it's truly unfortunate I end up looking forward to reading about the death of an athlete. However, you continue to set the standard for in-depth review and analysis of the situation. A friend of mine was in attendance at Kemper Arena and called me on his cell phone moments after the accident. Unlike many people around him, he didn't believe it was all a work in progress. Like myself, he couldn't believe the show was allowed to continue. One only needs to look at the situation regarding the death of a major league umpire on opening day a few years ago to see how the situation should have been handled. I guess there's no reason to think class would ever supersede refunding ticket money for the honchos in the WWF, which also makes me wonder just how sincere some of those interviews were the following night on Raw, not to mention that a major star such as Undertaker wasn't allowed out of character despite such a tragedy. Mistakes were obviously made before, during and after Hart's death. Unfortunately, this is an industry that seems to never learn from its past and it's only a matter of time before another tragic incident surfaces. Tony Kozalichki. Alexis, Illinois. The death of Owen Hart was clearly a tragedy and I wish my sincerest condolences to his family. However, much of the discussion in The Observer and many comments by both you and your readers seem to be missing the point. Vince McMahon continuing the pay-per-view in the greater scheme of things should not be a major issue, though it has taken on a life of its own. In order to be able to criticize McMahon, you and any of your readers would have needed to turn off the pay-per-view once it became clear Owen had likely died. I did not. I continued to watch. All I had to lose was $29.95 and not see the rest of the angles play out. It would be hypocritical for me, or anyone else who left their sets on, to be critical of McMahon on this point. Shame on me and everyone else who kept watching. The same is true of the Raw Tribute Show. How many of those who are critical of the show watched the entire show even after the first 15 minutes when it became obvious what the show was going to be? Giving up two hours of watching Monday Night Wrestling would be the best way to show respect to Owen Hart if one found the show insincere. Watching so one can get their Monday Night Wrestling fix and then criticizing it isn't respectful in the least. The nature of the angle being shot has nothing whatsoever to do with the extent of the tragedy. Your comments seem to imply that if there was a stronger angle, Owen's death wouldn't have been so tragic. This is a highly dangerous viewpoint, since it indirectly endorses that in some cases taking such high risks can be justified if they can advance one's career. That's absolutely wrong. Such risks should never be taken. Mick Foley's jump from the hell in the cell was 100 times more stupid than this, though thankfully the results weren't as serious, since the perceived risk of injury going in was probably much higher. The ratings war in wrestling pushes things, but they also can't be blamed. Much more good than bad has come to wrestling and to wrestlers in general as a result of the surge of interest due to the ratings war. The bottom line is that this was an accident. Nobody involved wanted anything bad to happen to Owen. If McMahon and the others in the WWF understood how dangerous the stunt really was, I'm sure they never would have had him do it. Even McMahon told Foley no more hell in the cell type stunts. The only issue that really matters in this case is that the WWF had an obligation to better research how dangerous the stunt may have been and the precautions that should have been taken. It will likely be up to a court to decide if there was negligence on the WWF in researching the stunt's dangers and in training Hart to perform it. My guess is that there probably was some negligence. Unfortunately, despite the fancy packaging and the high television ratings, the wrestling business is still in many ways very unsophisticated. How can they still blade in this day and age? Asking the right types of questions about the dangers of certain stunts to the degree a movie producer might, just isn't part of their culture. It needs to be. Probably the only way to get there is to bring some managers from outside the business into wrestling who can look at this world in a more sophisticated and objective manner, and give knowledge and advice to the decision makers, such as McMahon, as they modify the nature of the product. Keith Buckley. Glenview, Illinois. What makes Owen Hart's death so hard to accept, besides the fact that from all accounts he was a great guy? is that he was the embodiment of all that is good about pro wrestling. 
and he died in a stunt that exemplifies all that's bad about the industry. Owen was and looked like a great athlete. He wasn't a steroid freak. He was an incredible wrestler without being boring. He was very funny on the mic, without having to resort to a cartoon persona. He was a superstar who made money all over the world, and who did tons of jobs and tons of stupid angles. Hart should have spent that night in Kansas City having a great match, maybe even defending the WWF title, instead of being up in the rafters wearing blue feathers. The fact he didn't prove Vince McMahon isn't quite the genius everyone says that he is. Dan Weisberg. Brooklyn, New York. I'm amazed at your ability to place things in their proper perspective, especially in a bizarre, twisted world like pro wrestling. Separating the fantasy from the reality is truly the theme of The Observer. The June 14th issue made me do more soul-searching than any other issue I've read. Wrestling is indeed a sick business. When I saw the Hummer ran into Nash's limo, my immediate reaction was, should they be doing this so soon after Owen Hart's death? And I know Tony Schiavone was just trying to sell an angle, but it absolutely blew my mind when he said, after Sting was bit by the dogs, that in all his years in wrestling, this was the worst thing he'd ever seen happen to a wrestler. This happened just three weeks after a wrestler fell from the ceiling to his death in the ring. I don't know if the bookers or the higher-ups read The Observer, but if they do, they completely miss the point. Nothing, and I mean nothing, is immune from being used in the war, from trying to draw a rating or a buy rate, from the Hummer, to Undertaker talking about a day of reckoning. And it's not just about Owen Hart. Stuff like this has been going on since the war began. I'm sure there are a lot of good, decent people in wrestling, but it sure seems that to a lot of them, fantasy and reality are one and the same. As Vince would say, it's all just business. I reread my letter in the June 14th issue and still agree with my opinions, but I'm asking myself, what's the point? What am I trying to defend? A sick, twisted take no prisoners and win at all costs wrestling industry. Am I trying to defend Vince McMahon? When it first became evident that the Hearts would file a lawsuit, I'll be honest, I was disappointed. But the more I think about it, I think they are for the most part right on the money. I just wish they could sue the entire industry. I love wrestling and have since I was seven, and probably will for the rest of my life. I'll forever defend it against asinine comments like don't you know it's all fake? Or they're just actors. But my days of defending it against legitimate logical criticism and accusations may indeed be over. Barry Johns. Rincon, Georgia. I was rather upset by Hollywood Hogan's appearance at Owen Hart's funeral. When he arrived in Calgary, the media took a picture of him leaving the airport in a limo and wearing an NWO t-shirt. I recall seeing that photo in the paper and thinking just how tacky it was that he would wear that shirt. Further, as a family friend that was in attendance at the funeral, I was also disgusted when he made a dramatic entrance in front of the funeral home in his own personal limo. There were many legends and celebrities that came to pay their last respects to Owen, yet Hogan was the only one in the wrestling community, apart from the family of course, that felt he had to arrive in his own limo. He pulled up to the front door of the funeral home and even waited for the driver to come around and open his door, perhaps to heighten the suspense for the media. I feel he should have arrived discreetly that like everyone else, rather than make a big, showy entrance, in front of all the marks. Colin Ray utilized a limo, yet he drove in near the very end of the driveway, quietly climbed out himself, and walked in. Not even Mayor Dorr nor Premier Klein used limos or made flashy entrances. Name withheld by request. It seems like I barely had enough time to comprehend the tragic death of Rick Rude, when the news of Owen Hart hit. Upon hearing about it, I wished it was just some tasteless wrestling angle. I was shocked to hear they continued the show after the accident. The hypocrisy and lack of taste isn't just limited to the WWF. ECW honored the memory of Owen Hart by putting someone through a table covered in fire and thumbtacks every night. What class? Vince McMahon's depraved character was again revealed by his actions from the death and since that time in this whole sorry affair. Anyone who thinks the show should have continued should look to the recent Houston Astros game. In hindsight, the subsequent Raw was just another tool to get the company over. Performers who were obviously shook up had to bear their emotions on national TV while others were forced to talk about someone they really didn't know well and call them a family member, or talk about someone they actually disliked. Did anyone notice Shane McMahon making a point of involving Bret Hart in his story? The airing of the funeral footage the next week against the wishes of Martha Hart and the family was sickening. I guess they just couldn't pass up an opportunity to hurt the Hart family and in turn get back at Bret. One interesting aspect of the Sable lawsuit, if true, is the claim that Jim Ross tried to force her to sign a bad contract before a show. Wasn't that something similar to the basis of Jesse Ventura's successful lawsuit?
I'm surprised, but not shocked, at the arrogance of the WWF to continue to do this. To achieve his current success, McMahon has followed a few maxims of the 90s culture. The Jerry Springer anything goes mentality. Attacking the messenger whenever valid criticism comes up. And I feel your pain. The last one should now be I feel your pain and I will use it for my own advantage. Witness the WWF's attorney's assertion that Sable was taking advantage of the death of Owen Hart. The strong positioning of Shane and Vince on television was a clever move to minimize the power of the wrestlers and to assure potential investors that the WWF is a safe investment. However, with the flood of negative publicity and two huge lawsuits, this move may come back to haunt them. The boys can't be blamed for the death of a fellow wrestler, nor for trying to force a performer to accept terms which wouldn't be tolerated in other entertainment fields. This may be premature, but this looks like one of those times where you can see the beginning of the end of either the company, or at least the era. Ian Goodwin, Brooklyn, New York. I've been a subscriber for six years and have noticed that your irritation with wrestling is growing. I've been a fan for 19 years and have never been more disgusted than I've been over this entire ordeal after the death of Owen Hart. The way the WWF treated the Hart family is absolutely disgusting. It will take a long time before all the wounds are healed. Martha Hart continues to amaze me. She has shown a remarkable sense of strength, style and dignity in a trying time. She was thrust into the spotlight and she has showed what she is all about. Other wrestling wives should watch how she has reacted. I'm sure there will be other deaths to follow that will be just as big and they will need to know how to handle the press. Martha Hart is a normal person, like you and me. Too normal to deserve what has happened to her and her children. The wrestling wife has always been someone that has been made fun of because of what so many represent, strippers, airheads, etc. Not Martha Hart. She represents a regular woman who just happened to marry a relatively viceless pro wrestler. I hope the Hart family knows that they have the support of millions and they are in my prayers. Rhonda Farrar. Monroe, Louisiana. This letter is about Vince McMahon and whether or not he's a smart and successful businessman, a lying, cheating ratings whore, the antichrist of prime time television, or all of the above. I'm fascinated by the barrage of criticism that is being leveled at him in recent months. I can't help but think he invites and deserves much of it, but certainly not all of it. I have no problem with the decision he made to continue the pay-per-view. I hope to think it was one of those situations where, as an individual and a group, one is on shock and goes on automatic pilot in order to plow forward and simply finish what has been started. My experience with tragedy is that pure shock can go a long way to contributing to a decision that you later question yourself about, what the hell was I thinking? On the other hand, I do have to say that when Owen fell, if there were no immediate answers as to what exactly happened, the arena was a crime scene and maybe they should have stopped everything to make certain that no foul play was involved. Maybe this was done quickly on some level and the public doesn't realize it. I hope so. An incident of that magnitude deserves complete attention. As for the very public, and some private interchanges between the Hart family and the McMahons, I agree with something you wrote regarding Vince's decision to show footage from Calgary. If Martha asked him not to, that he shouldn't have. Personally, I know many fans appreciated it. It was tasteful, if also self-serving. It was part of the ongoing curiosity and grief over what happened to Owen. I think it was hardly worse than the short CNN showed of Owen being removed from the arena on a stretcher, at which point we now know he was dead, but I suppose hard news is allowed to show whatever they want. Still, although I believe the funeral montage served a purpose, Vince should have given Martha the respect anyone would want in the same situation. If she said not to tape, that should have been the end of it. It's regretful the family objected to the Raw show because that was one of the most touching and well put together shows I've seen in the wake of a wrestling world shakeup. As for the high profile the WWF had, and tried to have, at Owen's funeral, I wonder if that was a no-win situation. If the WWF had stayed away, wouldn't they have been severely blasted for appearing apathetic? If the WWF had been on better terms with the family at the time of Owen's death, then would the WWF's presence have been so objectionable even considering that Owen died at work? If the Hearts and McMahons were one happy family, would the company logo on the flowers be deemed tasteless? or a tribute from a company who considered Owen an important part of their success? I'm asking these questions simply to try and see both sides of this mess. Personally, I think Vince ruined his relationship with the Hart family by being so duplicitous in dealing with Brett. As with many other things in life, you reap what you sow. Vince, like many a dictator, doesn't appear to have a view of the real world around him that he doesn't control. That's too bad, because with his intelligence and daring and the resources of the WWF, he could really do some good in his lifetime and beyond. I don't believe Vince killed Owen Hart, at least not outright. 
but I do believe that the wrestling business, as it is, and as he has helped shape it, is a dangerous business. Does Vince carry any responsibility? Yes, certainly. The business is conducive to destructive behavior and not enough attention is given to safety or to respect of the performers. All of the many problems of pro wrestling can hardly be laid on McMahon's shoulders, but a few of them certainly are the result of his ego and lust for power. As for the Sable lawsuit that is causing such a furor among the fans, sure it's overblown in its demands. But come on. Isn't that exactly the idea? I feel the real purpose of this lawsuit isn't to acquire $110 million for Rena Mero. I feel the purpose of this lawsuit is to fight Vince under his own rules. Large, loud publicity with a spin. Some very public fault finding combined with you've now messed with the wrong person vengeance. Vince has pissed a lot of people off in his time, but seldom has anyone fought back in such an orderly but also a Vince-like fashion. Vince probably deserves it whether every point in the lawsuit is valid or not. And I agree with you that they are not all valid, but I don't think validity is the point of this lawsuit. You tend to reap what you sow. Now Vince is being approached with an overblown, hard-hitting, potentially embarrassing and expensive forum that could expose his business practices. With the much sadder heart lawsuit out my feeling is the WWF would be foolish to do anything but settle out of court with Rena. There are Gwen. Atlanta, Georgia. Response from Dave Meltzer. Nobody is critical of the WWF wrestlers attending the funeral or any of the wrestlers, aside for some criticism of Hogan, I don't think anyone is critical of any wrestler that appeared. A family member that spoke with me about it had nothing but positive to say about him being there, although I can say there were several others that have offered a differing viewpoint of his motives and actions. It's that it was so strongly encouraged by management to be there and everyone being flown in with the painted bus, the hairstyling, clothes, sunglasses, etc. that in hindsight shows it was treated as a television opportunity for the company although I think it would be unfair to question the motives of the wrestlers themselves. Because of how the family had come out with very public opinions of Vince, my feeling is that it showed a degree of selfishness that he appeared but from his standpoint I'm sure he felt duty-bound to attend but in doing so again didn't see the big picture even with Martha asking him to come, apparently because she wanted him to hear face-to-face -face exactly what she thought. I thought the way Earl Heckner handled it was really classy, wanting to be there because he liked Owen but realizing because of the past, that the best thing for him to do at that time was not put the family in a more uncomfortable position. Boyd Pierce I will forever be proud to have been friends with Boyd Pierce. For the last dozen years we spoke on the phone and got together at fan conventions. It wasn't unusual for Boyd to call several days in a row just to say hello and let me know he was about to travel with his wife Dorothy. Financially, he was set for life years ago but he was most comfortable being around the common wrestling fan and thoroughly enjoyed seeing others around wrestling. If he liked you, you couldn't have had a better more loyal and honest friend in the world. But he had a tamper, and if you crossed him, that was it and he never forgot. Perhaps the greatest line he ever said, was that while Rogers never met Fritz von Erich. Long before gimmicks were an avenue for most wrestling offices, Pierce in the 60s was known as the picture man in the Southwest selling photos, bumper stickers, keychains. He saved his money and was never beholden to wrestling. Bill Watts was a man Pierce had tremendous respect for. He often said Watts was one of the smartest men he had ever met. As for as his departure as a television announcer for Mid-South Wrestling, Boyd wasn't about to put up with the behind-the-back maneuverings done by Jim Ross and Bruce Pritchard, so he simply, with a smile, went home, and he enjoyed life even more. As a ring announcer, Boyd had a rule. The boys could do what they had to do, but if they ever put a finger on him, they were toast. On several occasions he jammed his microphone into their heads and often drew blood. He wasn't a wrestler so he felt it wasn't his job to be anyone's patsy. Uthez, Paul Bosch, Morris Siegel and Don Jardine were among those who he admired along with Lanny Poffo. Something to note, when he was selling gimmicks in the 60s, Jim Morrison of New Jersey who is now known as J.J. Dillon, was his best customer. Don Label. In New York. Sable. Sable's lawsuit against the WWF is a joke. The woman has posed nude twice for Playboy and has paraded around the WWF for the last year wearing almost nothing and loving every minute of it. Now all of a sudden, the WWF has become, obscene, titillating, vulgar and unsafe. That last word she used makes me wonder if she'll try and use Owen Hart's death to help her get what she wants. If the courts give her a penny, there are some serious flaws in our legal system. Ron Lemieux. Brantford, Connecticut. Response from Dave Meltzer there are really serious flaws in our legal system. Two weeks after Owen Hart's death I was amazed to hear about Sable suing the WWF for a multitude of sins save for killing JFK and causing the Titanic to sink. 
of the poll because this seemed to be a callous act of taking advantage of the WWF during a time of weakness, and let's not forget a stupid act as well. When Rena Mero came to the WWF, nobody except her husband knew who she was. She was just another in a series of valets for Triple H. At the time the hot valet in the WWF was Sonny. We watched her hook up with Mark Mero. We watched her chest grow bigger, smaller, then bigger again. Sonny's star was fading and Rena's was brightening. Then Sonny was gone as Sable was as hot as you can get. But her husband wasn't over. Then came TV Guide covers, Playboy, Mainstream Media Buzz, a title she never did anything for. Then Deborah McMichael showed up. Suddenly Sable turned into Sonny. Or maybe she turned into Norma Desmond. Deborah was given the belt and now the WWF has mistreated Rena. Someone took a dump in her bag. Someone drew on her picture. Her coffee wasn't hot enough. All her favorite TV shows had been cancelled. Wait, I can sue Vince for $100 million. Lose the suit or have it thrown out of court. My husband can get fired and I can become the next Shannon Tweed using my own name. Some guy can go into Blockbuster and see a box cover for a video starring Rita Mero and put it back because he's already forgotten who she was. Speaking of callous, every toy store in Chicago sold out of Owen Hart figures less than 24 hours after his death. An upcoming series has blue blazer figures so expect the same. Lawrence Evans. Chicago, Illinois. Speaking even indirectly in defense of either Vince McMahon or the WWF feels as uneasy as coming out in support of the NRA or the tobacco industry. But this whole Sable situation feels even worse. In recent years, a female executive for a television network signed a fat contract, only to be offered a fatter one elsewhere. When the first network refused to release her from her contract, she filed a lawsuit filled with lurid charges against network executives, charges that she offered to drop only if the first network would let her out of her contract. The Reno Mero v. WWF litigation text rang all the wrong bells for the people who remember that suspicious Hollywood case. Even before her first Playboy photos were developed in the lab, Rena Mero was telling showbiz insiders how she wanted out of the WWF for a career in movies or television. Anything except wrestling. However, she was also leaving a bloody trail of showbiz workers who learned how ungracious, ungrateful and insensitive she could behave toward the same people whose help she requested. Reno the egomaniacal diva might be tolerable after she is a star. But Rena the egotistical starlet is making too many enemies now, especially prudent people who see her suspicious suit against the WWF. What will she do when she wants out of her contract with them? Wrestlers love to blur the lines between work and shoot. But in the entertainment world where she wants to escape too, Rena Mero is already well on her way to building a reputation that makes Vince McMahon seem like a babyface. Name withheld by request. Deaths in Music I'd like to respond to the comparisons made in the letters page to deaths in the music industry and the pro wrestling industry. I'm a country bass player. I came along a generation after the outlaw country phase of the 70s and the pill popping country scene of the 60s, but I've been in a lot of bands and have done a lot of traveling. I've never seen one person die or even known one performer that I was worried about and thought might die. I have seen a fair amount of drinking. I've been on the road with a few potheads. I've seen a little, and I mean very little, cocaine use. I've hardly ever seen someone who showed up in a condition where his performance was impaired. Usually it's a few beers after the gig. The very few times there was a problem is that once a keyboard player was a drunk and the band leader fired him in Phoenix and sent him home. Another time after a festival in Wisconsin, a guitar player got totally messed up and was staggering around backstage. He was fired by his management when we got back to Nashville. I guess my point is that the music business can suck, but on the road the business polices itself, and this kind of thing just isn't tolerated. Is there any of that policing going on in wrestling? I've never been in a band where addictions were the norm. Is that the same in wrestling that so many are messed up so nothing is ever said and done? It really makes no sense to me. Terry Funk said and I agree with it that we are all captains of our own ship. To avoid boredom on the road, I bring wrestling tapes, reading material, video games and more. Even if I had nothing to do, I'm not going to start doing drugs. There are things in pro wrestling that aren't in the music business such as pain pills, steroids and all the plastic surgery. I think the way the women look in wrestling today is totally disgusting. A bunch of mutated freaks. And for what? To be treated like nothing more than meat? That bugs me a lot. Speaking of video games, I recently got the All Japan game for PlayStation. Interesting game. Very weird button configurations, but it's cool once you get used to it. The matches themselves are fun and build to a lot of drama. The game is very much all Japan. No weapons, fairly slow building. 
I don't think current WWF fans would appreciate it. If you beat the game in two-year career mode you get all the hidden characters, which is quite an impressive list of past and present guys. The edit mode has the hidden guys only. No way to create your own wrestler like you can in Token Retsuits 3 from New Japan, but it has a total of 58 move sets to choose from. The game is a definite thumbs up and makes a great contrast to the New Japan game. Both games are greatly set up to show the differences between the promotions. The Fire Pro G comes out for PlayStation on June 24. The six-man scramble on Sega Saturn is considered by many the best wrestling video game ever so I'm looking forward to it. Trent Vandress. Madison, Tennessee. Whether it's the clash of titans in the ring or the drama that unfolds outside it, we're here to break it down, match by match, feud by feud. Remember, in the world of wrestling, every day is a battle, and every victory is a story waiting to be told. Until next time, keep the passion alive, and never stop wrestling with the possibilities. This is the Pro Wrestle Machine.